So I think let's get started then. Okay. I'll start then, shall I? All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this inaugural Hyperledger TechFest event. Uh, I'm Julian Gordon. Uh, I'm the VP for Asia Pacific for Hyperledger, and I'm speaking from sunny Hong Kong today, and, and I'm delighted to be invited uh, to open this event. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Hyperledger India chapter, African chapter, and the APAC meetups for organizing this series. This is really a, a great show of collaboration. I think one of the first we've done across uh, multiple different chapters. So great, great uh, collaboration. So what is the Hyperledger Tech Fest? As I said in one of the LinkedIn messages promoting this event, one of the questions I always get and many people in the community get asked is how does one hear, get to hear and meet the contributors and maintainers of Hyperledger projects? Well, this is one of these events. Today you will hear and see four contributors or maintainers of Hyperledger projects. And those, these are the people that write the code. And without them, Hyperledger, Hyperledger is all about writing code. Uh, Hyperledger would not exist. Um, this is the first of three events and you'll hear from many other contributors over the coming weeks. Uh, it's such a great idea. Uh, there is so much great knowledge and experience to be shared from these uh, contributors and maintainers. And I'm looking forward myself to listening and interacting today. And please do interact, uh, ask questions. We have a Q&A channel, we have a chat channel. Please do ask questions. We wanna make this you know, interactive as well. So why uh, uh, the name TechFest? Well, Arun, who you're gonna be hearing from soon, who created this event, was keen to have it during the festival season here in India. So he came up with the term tech fest. So please do enjoy and do celebrate uh, this festival season and this Hyperledger tech fest. Um, by the way, if you don't know Arun, uh, he is the co-lead of the Indian chapter and also this month got voted to the global Hyperledger technical steering committee. So congratulations Arun on that. Uh, the technical steering committee or the TSC as it's commonly know, uh, is called the heart and soul of the Hyperledger project. And it is made up of contributors, like some of the contributors who, have, who are here today, who are elected once a year, and they are elected by the contributors of the project. It's what we call a duocracy. Those who get involved are those that run the projects. Uh, and you can listen to the, to the technical steering committee, and actually you can listen to any of the different projects, uh, their, their meetings, uh, and it's a great way uh, to get the feel and pulse of Hyperledger. So I really uh, recommend listening to the technical steering committee uh, calls. The second question I often get asked is how, how do I contribute? How does one contribute uh, to Hyperledger? I would encourage everyone listening you know, on this call, uh, on this uh, webinar today, uh, to get involved in the Hyperledger community. Com contribution can come in many different forms. You can contribute to projects and you're gonna be hearing about a number of projects today. And these, these projects are always eager to get more uh, contributors. Uh, you, can you can help organize events like this. You can help run the chapter. I talked to Arun before and he's looking for, for more and more people to help here, specifically in the Indian chapter. But all other chapters are looking for people. We need help with translation. We've done, I think like in Fabric, we have now nearly nine different languages. And some of that is done here uh, uh, in, in, a lot in India. We have Malayam, we have Chinese, we have Spanish, we have many, many languages, but we're always trying to make uh, you know, uh, what we do here at Hyperledger more accessible. So translation is something we're, we're very keen on. Writing documentation, it's, you know, very much a, a requirement. And obviously people who want to use technology, you know, the better the, the documentation, the, the more accessible it is. So basically any activity that helps build our support, our shared ecosystem with a Hyperledger. So please do contribute. A great way to start is actually to join, and I discussed this with the room just before, right? The Hyperledger India chapter calls. Uh, they happen every Thursday afternoon. Uh, you can find out the, the times and the, and the call-in numbers on the Hyperledger wiki. So that's wiki.hyperledger.org and then drop down in, in groups and you'll see uh, uh, the Hyperledger uh, India. And actually maybe we can put the, that link uh, in, in the chat today. So, so please do, or, or not just in your chat, but anyone, just reach out to any of us, any of these contributors, anyone involved in Hyperledger. Uh, everyone is very, very open to helping people uh, come and help contribute uh, to this uh, ecosystem, to Hyperledger. 
So that was just a quick few words. I'd first, uh, I would like to say thank you for all attending. Um, stay safe uh, and, and enjoy this event. Okay, over to you, Arun. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. That was a great introduction. And yes, we welcome all sorts of contributions from India. And even if you are a developer or program managers or project maintainers, then please do feel free to join the weekly calls. I just shared the link on chat for all of your reference. And you will also find this public information and in pub just public calendars events. And to start with today's event, we welcome you again for warmly. And we will be starting with uh, Mr. Gopinath, who is a senior scientist at NIC, um, Government of India. And then he will be speaking about how to write a transaction processor, or how to write a smart contract in Hyperledger Sotu. And we'll now switch over to um, Mr. Gopinath. Thank you, Arun. Uh, can I just uh, do my presentation? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, as Arun told, uh, I work at some senior scientist uh, um, in National Informatics Center, uh, Government of India. It is a technology arm for uh, Government of India. So. I work in a network division where we run a countrywide uh, national knowledge network. So that is something like internet too uh, in America. So some uh, similar kind of network we have. In fact, we pair with internet too also. So basically I am in that part area. But uh, I mean, uh, in my group, uh, we are all all around us. So we work with software, we work with that people and uh, we share knowledge, everything and then make it. So I have been doing system administration also quite some time back and uh, um, know, uh, knows about the importance of uh, the various, uh, the verticals uh, in ICT, especially in government uh, say, scenario. So apart from working, uh, so I, I am doing my higher education. So I'm doing my master's. So in my master's, uh, I have to do a project work. The final semester is all about a project work. So. Um, in fact, you can see the logo here uh, in my presentation. It is not of NIC. I put uh, um, uh, the logo of my institute, uh, BSC Crescent Institute of Science and Technology. So uh, the project. So I am interested. I am always been wondering, uh, say, because uh, the logs are very important for me. Whenever the router exchanges uh, the route information, it has to be logged. Whenever somebody logs in my email system, there is a log. When the mail goes from X to Z, there must be a log. And the law enforcing agencies may ask for a log. The log is a very critical thing, very important thing for various reasons. So how to make that immutable? I mean, how to secure the logs? How can I prevent anyone can have in the, so I, can, I mean, I'm basically an Unix guy. So I know uh, log into root and then go to that where logs is, uh, then uh, you open any log file and delete some file. I mean, it is very easy to tamper it. So how to make that, uh, uh, this thing, how, why not I use blockchain for that part? So the complete investigation on, on this aspect uh, and uh, made me to uh, uh, do a project in this particular area. So my project title uh, is trustable logs using blockchain. I'm not the first person to invent these things, but this idea is natural to me because I'm in that field making it, I, one minute. So uh, the problem statement is something like this. Events are recorded as logs. Logs are used for various purposes. Regulatory authorities requires that most of the legacy systems are tamperable. I can use warm device if I want to make uh, reasonably a trustable thing, uh, but it is very uh, costlier and I can't do that in every each and every case. Uh, is there any solution using software like blockchain? Yes, because the other name for blockchain is uh, basically immutability. These are the two phases I have done. The phase one is basically a steady thing and phase two is an implementation uh, thing. So 
And the next thing is, since it is an academic project, there is always an intention that I should learn something new. So the Rust is a beautiful language, I'm told. So I wanted to learn Rust. When I wanted to learn Rust and do this part, then I have been searching uh, which blockchain platform supports Rust as an SDK. Then naturally the sawtooth also comes. I never even thought what are the complications or how easy it is or how tough it is for uh, the sawtooth. I just selected that part. Uh, assuming that at some point of the time, I'm going to get succeed in that part and the people are going to help me in that part. So the, I become a member in Hyperledger group and I've been exchanging the messages. I've been reading the documentation. Then I get to know the weekly meetings are happening and there I got the contact of our own, et cetera. And then the things grown. So my implementation is a very simple one. It's a four node blockchain cluster and I use AWS because anywhere I can go there, I can just uh, access that part. And, uh, and these are the literatures uh, uh, I require to refer. Um, uh, there are already a lot of literature on how to build a trustable blockchain. For example, the first prop, uh, the paper uh, uh, try to implement uh, using Exonum. So again, it is a PBFT system. So other people also making it. And uh, uh, the one beautiful paper is Vitalik Buterin's white paper, which I really learned something about. Uh, I'm trying to learn something about the blockchain. And another beautiful uh, the paper, uh, the introduction to Sawtooth to PBFT uh, in the blog, wonderful, beautiful, uh, plain English, simple English, and uh, beautifully explained it. So uh, these are the uh, literatures uh, I referred uh, uh, during my project. So what is the architecture of my thing? Uh, let me understand, uh, I mean, uh, put it like this. Uh, so I have four blockchain nodes and uh, the logs are basically generated by the systems, the various systems. It could be an email system, it could be a router, um, uh, or it could be a banking transaction or any for any system for that matter. There is something called log sources. Then I have a build, uh, what is called a log network. I, I, I built a log network. What I do is so I send the logs to all the blockchain nodes. Um, in real time, in real time, or uh, for example, if the log is generated immediately that is sent to all the blockchain nodes uh, so that the blockchain nodes knows that this event is really happened. It is in real time. It is all sending it. Then I got a separate blockchain network, PBFT network. I have all the four nodes are there and uh, I have a PBFT network is a separate, uh, separate network. Logically, it is a separate. It can be uh, residing in the same uh, IP subnet. Uh, but logically, I mean, for understanding purpose, I keep it as a separate one. So like this. So what happens, it is all getting accumulated. Then the owner of the log source, uh, he generates a transaction. For example, uh, uh, let us take for in, uh, instance, uh, I'm trying to record uh, the mail log. So let the file name me slash pair slash log slash mail log. So whenever there is a mail, the, whenever there is an event happening, the logs are emitted on these logs are all transported in real time to the blockchain nodes. And then after some time at the end of the day or whatever it is, then the owner of the mail, the, 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 the person who is in charge of that particular resource, mail log log. So that person generates a transaction and then he files to uh, one of the nodes. Then the PBFT network takes care of everything and then it, the transaction, I mean, because all the nodes, uh, I mean, uh, the transaction processor is able to access uh, the, the logs uh, which are generated already, then it can compare whether I'm telling uh, uh, the, the, this, the transaction which I'm generating at this point of time is correct or wrong. Then if it is so, then it is pushed onto the blockchain and it grows like that. So this is the whole setup I have. So later at some point of time, an auditor comes and he wants to verify uh, the mail logs and log. Then he asks the owner of the log, give me your transaction, I mean, give me your log file. So he takes the log file. Then he uses the same kind of structure and uh, he queries the blockchain node. So this is the log from byte, I mean, start byte is zero, end byte is say 1024. What is the hash of that part? 
if that hash matches the blockchain hash then that particular thing uh, is said to be not tampered with the then it queries for what is the i mean uh, from 1025 to byte to 2047 to byte so what is the thing so like that uh, you can query and that part and then uh, you can verify and each block uh, um, each block of the log you can just verify and if he satisfied that's fine he goes forward that part so here i can have something called a partial trust establishment suppose if uh, the mail log or the squid log or web web proxy log generates in a few tons of uh, uh, megabytes so if tampering has been done at only one at one particular point i don't need to uh, throw the entire thing i can just uh, i mean it is basically the it, it is a byte boundary system so which are the things are all is intact that alone i can take it back and then i can do that part so here after the logs are all generated what i can do is uh, the blockchain nodes need not store uh, the real logs the only the hashes can be stored so you can uh, the purge the, the other stuff uh, i mean the original log stuff uh, so you can store only the hashes uh, so there is no uh, the space constraint also in this part so i got the client module and transaction processor module and verification module so the client on behalf of laxos as i told the log stream is there the transaction batches and then it sends to the uh, sawtooth validator the transaction processor business logic runs in every node and transaction process semantic just a minute i think i am uh, chosen a wrong uh, powerpoint just a minute just a minute so what exactly i'm storing about the log and this is my payload so i have i mean i have uh, this is the payload I, st i store some id for example if it is a mail log of this particular thing i give some id it is a basically a 32 bit integer some id is there then i take the start byte and end byte so i got two implementation so in one implementation let us take that the second implementation it is a 64 bit start byte and end byte and what is the data size uh, data hash value Uh, short to be six so on this payload is uh, c bar uh, c serialized using c bar so what is the programming model of a short to so short to we got what is something called validator that is a blockchain node and within the validator system the transaction processor is running this transaction processor is uh, the application specific which means that every application developer should implement this transaction processor so the transaction processor uh, i mean it basically validates transaction semantics and all business logics are applied over there and that in, in the validator the blockchain node the validator contains what is called the global state so the clients the person or i mean or the systems who are going to submit the transactions through rest api they are going to get contact the validator submit it and suppose they want to retrieve some kind of state they can retrieve that part so this is thick i mean uh, uh, 40000 feet uh, the uh, the i view of uh, um, what is the uh, i mean what, this all about the sort of uh, at a very high level so inside the blog, i mean uh, the sort of uh, the, the the validator uh, we have uh, something called uh, there is a block map this is a basic diagram these are the transaction processor and this transaction processor is we have to write it and we have to place it this is basically the core of uh, the validator so it contains a global state it contains blocks uh, uh, it contains consensus engine proxy which means the consensus engine is pluggable for example in my case it is pbft and uh, there is a block handler trans tp handler transaction 
uh, processor handler, everything is there. And this uh, the network part, uh, which makes the, the full mesh uh, connectivity with uh, other nodes. So what I do is uh, uh, I read the file blocks. Suppose uh, I'm given the log stream. Uh, for me, the it is a basically log is a stream of bytes. So which means it could be uh, that I, I don't uh, say that the law, uh, um, it should be in with the CRLF or something like that. So it could be even a binary file. It could be even a binary log. So for me, the logs or the events are recorded in a stream of bytes. Zero to byte, uh, it starts from a byte A to start with the, that is a log. So I read the stream and I generate the payload. How do I generate the payload? I take, uh, I give the ID for that particular stream, take the start byte, in byte, calculate hash, that is my payload. And I, uh, then I do, I just push the payload. So after a certain count, I generate into a transaction, set of transaction, and set of transactions are then pushed to the batch. And then finally, I push it to the, uh, call the REST API and submit to the one of the nodes. So this is another thing. I have payload and I got the various serialization, uh, this thing. So the payload is represented by the, the either CBAR, CBAR or protobuf or CSV, whatever format. Then the transaction letter generation I will do. For that, I need a key. So the transaction I create, then the batch header I have to create, then push the transaction into batches, then I make a submission. So this figure is something that the entire thing, the whole chain, I put it, but it is not really visible. I could not able to make that uh, it because uh, I was, uh, I mean, I thought that I can do some better presentation, uh, but last three days or four days uh, uh, completely suffered from there. So I could not able to even enlarge or uh, make it, I did not even touch that. What is a transaction processor modules? It is runs in every sawtooth node. Suppose I write an application in uh, a sawtooth application, all the business logic, I put it in a transaction processor. So this transaction processor, I need to run in all the blockchain nodes. Uh, suppose I have uh, the, uh, the four nodes. Now all the four nodes, I have to run the same transaction processor module. Multiple transaction processor can run at the same time. A blockchain node can contain, can support various application at the same time and multiple transaction I can run at the same time. And it uses a git set methods uh, to set the state with the payload and uh, uh, to read the state, I can use the get method and then make it. So the transaction processor module uh, has to uh, implement an apply method. There is something called an apply method, which the validator calls. So what happens is whenever a, a validator node receives a transaction from any client and depending upon its uh, family name, family version, it selects, uh, uh, I mean, uh, which transaction processor it belongs to. And accordingly, it calls that particular apply method and then the business logic runs in that part. Depending upon the business outcome, either your transaction, whatever we write, that transaction processor set the, the state or get the state. So this is the basic overall idea of uh, what is a transaction processor model. So the same is depicted over here. This is the transaction processor which I have here. And uh, first, uh, whenever a transaction processor, uh, when I start run, the first thing is, uh, I have to say hello to validator. I have to do something called registration. I have to tell I am the transaction processor. So I am listening on this particular family name and family version. It is something like opening a TCP IP socket, something like that. Uh, so I'm listening on the particular part. So uh, the validator node knows that part. So whenever it receives a transaction of that particular part, and after uh, doing some kind of a syntax validation and it is okay, then it just uh, calls uh, the particular apply method over that part and then make it out. So basically you have an apply method, the validator send TP process request and the trait object, uh, uh, the transaction contest. These are masked as a parameter to the apply method so that when the apply method returns and it can take all these things, basically the transactions are uh, uh, sent over here. So accordingly, it can do this processing and then uh, uh, it can get us in the method. So the transaction, uh, uh, 
So it, it depends upon, I have to set the family name, family version, and what is the namespace, etc. So, uh, so this is what uh, uh, I got it basically. So, I mean, the various verification, a lot of uh, print line statements, a lot of things are there. So uh, because of my conditions right now, I stop here. So uh, kindly excuse me for my poor presentation today because uh, of my situation. So probably next time, I think I hope to do uh, the better stuff. I stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank sir. you. We have a couple of questions if you don't mind answering them. So the yeah. first question is, where are the logs actually stored? The logs are uh, initially, the logs are also stored in the blockchain nodes. When it is get transaction is when the when I fire the transaction of that particular thing and then uh, it gets into record into the block, then the, the logs are not necessary to be stored in the uh, blockchain node. But I can always the but re, the, the the logs owner need to store it in some safe storages to produce to the auditor at later point of time. But the transaction processor requires, because how the transaction processor requires to know what is really the log, then only they can come into consensus and then uh, they can uh, record the hash. So for that only, initially they require the log at real time, uh, store it temporarily for some time. And the moment the transactions are over, then I can uh, throw off those logs in the blockchain node. Thank you. And one more question. So how long did it take for you to build the, such a system, including testing, et cetera? No, I started somewhere in, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, February, uh, Feb uh, last week, where I started interacting and all. So initially, I mean, I suffered a lot. I suffered a lot in the sense that uh, reading documentation, uh, the rust itself is a challenge for me because rush, uh, uh, I want to do in really in rust. Uh, so I have chosen that part and uh, really the things are not went on well. So if uh, Arun can remember uh, uh, one thing that in one night I just wrote to Arun uh, somewhere in first week of March or second week of March uh, that I want to switch over to Python and really struggling. Then he sent some sample files. So uh, just few side insight on that part. I got a clue in that part. Then I started writing. So I think uh, uh, practically if you take the first week of March or second week of March, I really started. And uh, uh, initially I just completed in the April itself, I completed it. So uh, thing is that uh, I started using like a Bitcoin style because if, uh, any blockchain, uh, uh, any person who want to read about blockchain, uh, the, the thing is that uh, naturally one, has, uh, one will follow about the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin, everything there in the blocks, so there is no, something called, there is no emphasis on states. There is no addressable states and all. So I started doing right. In fact, I'm started storing everything in this, uh, uh, you know, in one particular state. Then for verification, I started digging the blocks and then taking out it. In one Dan Milton video, I saw that one, uh, he specifically told, no, 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 this is not at all. Uh, in video, he told that this is not a blockchain. You have to use states. Then my God, then I have to rewrite my uh, program. Then I went to the second style of programming. Then that took about, because there is no much of it. Only thing is I have to uh, manipulate the addresses. So for some reading material is required. So then that took about 15 days or so, not uh, much of time. I think uh, three months time, uh, maximum three months time, I believe. But the polishing and fine tuning, it takes a lot of time. That's the, I'm not counting it. But the core stuff, I think uh, two and a half months to three months, I think I did that. And thanks to Arun. He answered a lot of questions through email. Thank you. And supported. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you again. So we'll move on to our next presentation. Next topic for today is about how do we how do we scale up our fabric network? How do we make it like 10, 1,000 times much faster? And to speak about this kind of, to answer these kind of questions, we have uh, a, a team joining us from United States. 
and I would like to welcome uh, Mike and his team. Uh, hi, Michael. Um, so Michael is the CEO of Prasaga, and I would hand over to Michael for further uh, session. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for uh, inviting us and allowing us to participate in here. So is my screen being shared? Is always first question. Yes. Okay. And we'll just go to slideshow. All right. <clears throat> uh, again, thank you. And yes, we do have uh, uh, the team on. So let me make a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Michael Holdman. I'm founder and CEO of Prasaga. Uh, Prasaga is a blockchain uh, technology company. Um, we are um, uh, have designed and are building uh, an open, permissionless, trustless chain with uh, a, a, on a uh, token uh, based entity. Um, and uh, uh, through the process of doing some things, we, uh, we have run into uh, some uh, understanding or enlightenment about blockchain uh, scaling issues and such. And that's what we're going to talk about here, specifically one of the uh, uh, technologies that have come out of our research and, uh, and, and design phases. So, um, in, our, in the process of, uh, of looking at how to scale a blockchain, one of the things that came into uh, account was the fact that um, we couldn't see a way to truly scale because of the inability to, to actually move state uh, from, uh, par between parallel chains from shard to shard uh, when they started to come up with the sharding technology. And the things that we found here, and it's a challenge as we say in chain code, but the same in smart contracts. Um, they're static, they're not dynamic. Um, versioning or updating chain uh, smart contracts or chain code is difficult. Uh, we compare it to um, a smart contract to uh, um, uh, say uh, every time you wanna write a Word document, you have to write the Word application. You basically have to copy a smart contract uh, paste it into an editor, edit it, and then upload it. So you're re-uploading the program every single time. Um, they're not easily created or updated. Um, it, it can take, depending on the complexity, yes, you can do a simple smart contract in order to do a transfer of a token from one wallet to another. Um, uh, however, it's uh, uh, when you're starting to get into complex supply chain and such like that, it is not as easily done. Um, it can take multiple FTE years to create and deploy. Code requi requires reloading for each new contract, and it doesn't have a global repository. So what we have uh, is the extensible blockchain object model. Now, a little history about extensible blockchain object model. Um, uh, it is, uh, we call it a decentralized global operating system. And the, the, the first time we've uh, integrated it with a blockchain is on Hyperledger. Um, we'll go back to the, uh, where it started from. And that was, uh, it, it's, it's based on a messing, message passing architecture, which was developed by Xerox Labs uh, uh, Park. That's a Palo Alto research. Uh, and um, it was it, the, the message passing architecture architecture called small talk was introduced in the early 70s. Um, since then, it's been used as an underlying architecture for the leading global operating systems. Uh, you might remember, um, and we compare a lot to smart contracts to an MS-DOS. Uh, MS-DOS where you can run uh, one application at a time. Uh, and then uh, the invent or the introduction of Windows. Uh, and Windows is a common object model, a class tree. Uh, it's, a, it's a modified version of the first class object model. First class object model was actually uh, also uh, utilized by IBM in a system object model and another organization called Gold Corporation in their uh, 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 Penpoint OS, which was a tablet based operating system. Uh, the other uh, organization that uses the a first class object model or uh, modification modified first class object model would be Mac OS uh, 10. Um, it was used by uh, Steve Jobs uh, when uh, he had Next and started Next OS. So history on uh, on on 
you know, what the uh, uh, first class object model is, is there. Dave Bieberman will go further into this. Um, I'm kind of going to do the highlights and then Dave is going to go into, he's this, the uh, co-founder and CTO. He's going to go deeper into the actual tech. He's going to show what, uh, how uh, classes and objects work within Hyperledger and also do a, a, a brief um, uh, code uh, review or loading that uh, show it how it loads into Hyperledger. Um, and what it is, is basically an object oriented blockchain. Now we did have one individual, Casey Tam, uh, who is a Hyperledger instructor. Uh, he was uh, gracious enough to uh, do a, take time to do a review of the uh, development environment and uh, test net that we have set up and available now. Um, it is uh, MVP, this is not uh, production ready yet, but it does allow you to go in and start to uh, uh, use object model, use the XBOM and test it out on Hyperledger. The interesting thing that this does, and uh, I, I highlighted it, theoretically, the developer does not care about the blockchain as it is well handled by the infrastructure. So to go into here, the advantages of having an extensible blockchain object model uh, it makes go to market 10x faster, 100x faster. The reason is because everybody is referencing the same exact class or copy of code. You're not rewriting code and uh, each time and uploading it uh, into the contracts. Um, it's, it's fully dynamic. Um, it, it, you're instantiating or referencing code from a class tree into your account. It's real-time updates. There's no service interruptions. If somebody sends you a transaction and you do not have the uh, proper code in order to execute that transaction or whichever part of that transaction you're supposed to, then your account will look up the class tree, find the, in, the, the code um, that's necessary for you to execute that transaction. And if you have all the proper credentials, uh, it will instantiate it into your account on Hyperledger. Uh, it creates a repository of reusable code throughout all nodes. And it makes many to many relationships feasible on a, ch on a single chain. And what we mean by this in supply chain, uh, we, we find that the issue is not when you're at the, say General Motors at the top of the chain, but it's when you're the bolt, the bolt manufacturer down at the uh, in, in lower in the tree in your supply chain tree. And what that's going to, uh, what XBOM allows you to do is it doesn't care if it's an IBM blockchain platform Oracle blockchain platform, SAP, or any others. If you're on AWS, the XBOM just knows that you're a Hyperledger fabric blockchain. And so it will integrate or implement uh, with that. So what we have developed um, is a blockchain application framework. Uh, on the business side, what this looks at is everything from layer uh, three, four, five, and six. Layer five in this instance is Hyperledger. Um, is unknown or not does not have to be uh, managed at all by the application developer. The application developer always plays up in uh, layer two and the applications are just the applications where the user interface will uh, or where the user, user interfaces with the blockchain. Um, applications can cover, you know, uh, whether it be pharmaceuticals, oil and gas, aviation, uh, the list goes on. So what Dave is going to do, and I'm going to turn him over here in a few in, in a minute or two, is he's going to go deeper into how we're actually integrated into XBOM uh, and go into the uh, how we're integrated into the peer nodes. Um, one of the things that we had to make sure when we do when we develop this is that um, we don't do any changes to the Hyperledger uh, uh, source or any of the other source that's, that's utilized uh, in order to uh, uh, make a successful Hyperledger. Uh, fabric network. And the other thing that Dave will do is go through and show you exactly how code loads dynamically. Um, again, you don't have to add more chain code. You don't ever have to add new channels. Um, you can dynamically add new classes to a class tree. And whenever those classes are necessary or the code within those, the, those class objects are necessary, the chain, your account automatically uh, instantiates a, a, an ob that class object into your account. So I will go ahead and stop sharing. I will let Dave carry on. If anybody has any questions on this part of it, please do ask. 
I will be back to talk about uh, uh, the finish up uh, the last part after Dave is done. Good morning. Share screen. Pull this up. Share. And okay. Good morning. Can everybody see my screen? I assume yes. So um, a couple quick things about the uh, extensible blockchain object model. Another way to think about this is um, instead of object-oriented programming, an object-oriented blockchain. Uh, the uh, uh, I'll go into what um, why we, how we do that, but the core piece to rec recognize is that for any object in any object-oriented environment, it needs a reference to it. In a programming environment, you have essentially a pointer managed by the uh, programming runtime environment, whether it's um, everything from C++ to Java to C Sharp to Python to you name the language. Actually, even Golang, even though it doesn't do inheritance, does the same thing. Uh, what we recognized is that a interesting part of the blockchain is because it's immutable, you can have completely unique um, references, object references stored on the blockchain. And we take advantage of that. And you'll see how that makes what's called a first class object model. And uh, first class object models go all the way back to small talk. And before that, small talk uh, being the uh, language in the designer, the author of it, who invented the term object oriented programming. And we're basing that all the way back on that technology, which is all message passing with what's called late dynamic binding or very late dynamic binding. First, a little bit about how we put it onto the Hyperledger fabric. Um, technically, we probably could put this on um, Hyperledger Sawtooth as well, although we started down the path of fabric first and we're focused on uh, getting a proof of concept out. Um, on the left, you'll see a traditional, um, I, I use the word traditional because that's how Hyperledger fabric works. I don't mean that as a negative thing, is that this is how, how it actually works. You uh, launch the blockchain. Um, we actually use the test network um, from the fabric samples, and you'll see that later. And then you load chain code code, a little redundant, but, um, and then you uh, run on it. And the uh, transactions are sent to the train code, and the chain code interacts with the database in the state database layer in the blockchain consensus layer, manage that. Um, in our environment, we don't change any of the Hyperledger fabric code to make this work. The difference is that for us, the chain code layer loads the class manager infrastructure that enables the uh, class manager environment or classes and objects. Above that, you dynamically load class code um, um, into your runtime environment. We actually use what's called the um, external um, chain code model for Hyperledger Fabric. Um, as, re as opposed to having the Hyperledger fabric build the source in a Docker for you. you it's a, a part of version 2.0 and beyond. Um, on top of that, we have class application framework in um, um, ordinary objects and accounts. Walk through them very quickly, similarly. So in the um, standard environment, the uh, first part, your Hyperledger fabric is managed by peer nodes and orderers. Um, what you'll see is that uh, 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 test network, we actually just use a simple one. It runs two nodes and one orderer. Um, the orderer um, going to, I believe it's currently doing raft. I don't remember how it's configured, but it's transparent to us. The chain code layer, you use literally load as a peer. Using a, we're using all command line from the peer node command at the moment, but obviously you can send strings as well from an API. The uh, peer node uh, loads the chain code um, as a, uh, for an external chain code, you actually send out a, a tar zip file uh, that's configured appropriately. You can read that in the um, online tutorial for um, Hyperledger Fabric. Um, we, uh, a very important point, I think we skipped so far, and this just reminded me, our current implementation, all of the classes are written in the Go programming language. Um, and they're loaded as shared objects, which are known as Go, Golang plugins. And there's a specific command to enable doing that with Go. Uh, what's very important here is we're not actually at runtime. Um, we're not actually compiling the code. Uh, you're literally loading a, a pre-compiled code. So, um, and it only needs to be loaded once 
uh, per node when it runs a transaction. Once a, a class is loaded, um, it, gets, it can stay in the environment. So you don't really have an overhead for loading it. Uh, class application framework, I will show you the foundation classes and we have a diagram of it. Um, and we will uh, just do a very quick command line load to show that we actually call them the bootstrap classes. And once they're loaded, you have the ability to create accounts. Accounts can contain ordinary objects and similar. Um, an account is an object instance. Um, every account has one root object called the account object, and then everything else is considered containment underneath it. So you have a containment tree for each account. We use that model um, superimposed on top of this environment. Um, that's part of the uh, uh, bootstrap classes. Um, I, it is actually possible to think of other models, but in the blockchain world, accounts are the um, common um, construct for everybody. A little bit about what a first class object model means, because it's very, very relevant for what, how we made this work. Um, in a first class object model, everything are actual objects. They exist at runtime. This means that the class that creates the object, so here's class object, which creates ordinary objects. In a meta class, excuse me, a meta class object makes classes, which make objects. And you have a reference to each one of these. Because the uh, blockchain is completely immutable, it's now rather rather trivial to make global references to every single object, whether it's a meta class, a class, or an object. And of course, everybody's inheritable, so you can inherit from a meta class or a class. You can't inherit from an ordinary object. Uh, this is a key thing because it means that once you've established any object or any class or any meta class, that reference is usable anywhere at any time bar uh, with, with respect to any sort of scoping rules. Like if you're not allowed to send a message for, uh, into somebody else's account, that type of thing. But as far as the reference itself is concerned, it's just another object reference. Uh, the basic structure, once you've loaded the uh, class manager infrastructure, uh, loads the root class object. So everything, this is a, a single inheritance, not a multiple inheritance, although it could be done with multiple inheritance. So it's single inheritance with the ability to create interfaces. The uh, root uh, inherited, the root um, object is called class object. Um, the uh, uh, class class is the root meta class. In class dictionary maintains a string mapping between uh, names in what we call ledger object IDs. What I mean by that is we create, like I just said, the um, like I just pointed out here, the uh, independent um, object IDs, which we actually do a chain hash to create using the standard uh, SHA 256 algorithm. In the um, in order to map back and forth, we call those ledger object IDs so that you can actually work from strings. As you'll see farther on there, we return the um, uh, 256 hash as a, a string of uh, uh, integer numbers. This is what the bootstrap classes look like. So the um, uh, for to enable dynamic loading of new plugins on any node, which you need any class implement, sorry, all class implementations are plugins. So when you, um, if you send a transaction to a node that hasn't seen that object or that class tree yet, needs to be able to go load it. The class class file loader is what's used to go load a new plugin in and then establish that the class is there. Um, the uh, Technically, the class instance data is on the blockchain already. This is to load the code to run the class. Class XBOM is now the root of all future uh, classes. So um, just like class objects root for all classes, class XBOM is for everything related to the XBOM environment. Uh, going down the tree just a little bit more, the class XBOM container is what implements the concept of containment uh, parent-child relationship. This is uh, literally a list of children with any, any child can be another XBOM container or subclass and have more children. This is identical in concept to an actual window tree that you use every day and we're using right now. Um, the only difference, of course, is this is not a user interface. It's a, a, just a straight object-oriented containment environment. And of course, the class account, which is a root for accounts, um, 
is of type class XBOM container, which means that it can contain objects. And I have a picture of that farther down. On the left side is the part that uses what's known as a standard design pattern called a factory design pattern, which of course we named class factory, not very original. And a class account manager inherits from class factory, which means an instance of class account manager will have the uh, ability to create new objects in the objects that, you, that it would intend to create would be um, accounts. So you would expect that the class account manager will create instances of class account or a subclass. And that's exactly what happens. Um, a little bit more on the bootstrap cycle. Um, once it's created all those classes, um, and of course there's a little bit of bootstrap uh, class, class file loader loads classes but you have to actually load class class file loader first to be able to load classes so that piece is actually done manually and then you could use it to load all the other classes which we do uh, we then instantiate two initial objects the root dictionary which is an instance of class dictionary to give you a way to have a bootstrap to find initial ledger object ids in the root account which is what you need to use to be able to send messages to anything um, all um, all messages sent to all objects, you uh, are meant to, you have to send the message to an account, to the object in the account with the method name that you're calling your message name and the um, uh, uh, input arguments for it. So you need those two things to get it running and you'll see that shortly. This is what the whole thing looks like. Uh, so at this point, you're ready to actually now create an account. I'm actually going to go do this in a minute. And this is what an account would look like. So here's a root account object. And this, I'm sorry, this is the root of an account. I'm using the wrong word, root account. So this is an account object. This could be a subclass. This could be an instance of class account as it shows, or an instance of a subclass of class account. It supports, uh, because again, it inherits from the XBOM container. It is perfectly possible to have any number of objects within that account in any object that also inherits containment also can be another object, uh, another uh, child list. It's important to note that it was hard to uh, diagram it correctly, but because the object, the ledger object IDs are not typed, they're all, you can send a message to any object, whether or not the object is of the right type or not. If you send a message that an object doesn't recognize, it will simply return not implemented means that all lists are heterogeneous lists of objects. Um, this is different than you'll see in most object-oriented environments, which are trying to do that type of type checking at compile time. We don't do that. There is some type checking we do for um, to make uh, the uh, message passing easier, but at runtime, it's actually possible to send any message to any object. Uh, late dynamic binding has some uh, interesting capabilities that um, enable uh, a different type of um, object-oriented programming that you might be used to, for example, if you write in Java code. Here's what a transaction looks like. Um, the database we use, whether it's a CouchDB or LevelDB, which is the Hyperledger database. Um, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with Hyperledger Sawtooth's database, but I assume it's similar, runs a keyword key value. For us, the keyword is always a ledger object ID. Ledger object ID is normally the 256 uh, SHA-256 value. In the instance data, the data is actually the instance data of the object instance. Now remember that classes and meta classes are objects too. So the instance data for the class, the instance data for the meta class are stored in here as well. We take advantage of that. Um, as it says on the right, um, we manage um, all of the inheritance and um, uh, the uh, pulling the instance data off of the blockchain at runtime at a transaction processing. Anything that's changed is automatically put back on the blockchain. If you don't make any change in instance data, then it doesn't make any update to it. And because of the automatic replication of the database, um, you don't need to do anything else at that point. Going down the, the very straight flow, um, transactions start, you're actually sending from a client, um, the account object, the target object. Again, you, you retrieve the ledger object ID, so I'll show you how that's done. The method name with method you're calling on the object and the input arguments. 
the class manager infrastructure does um, uh, uh, first uses the object uh, ledger object ID, the LOID key to look up the object, make it walks up the class tree to make sure that all the classes are there, pulls all of the instance data out so you now have a running object. This all happens transparently and the method gets dispatched to it. The method does inheritance so that if the method is inherited from one of the ancestor uh, classes, it will call the appropriate one. And then you can actually do um, ancestor calls. You can, solve, you can say call ancestor and walk right up the tree. Executes the uh, code, uh, which can include, by the way, calling any other object um, you're in your environment that you're legally allowed to so that the transaction can consist of multiple changes to multiple objects instance data. When you when the transaction completes successfully, the data is written back to the database automatically, and then you return with a, a, a as long as there's no um, error returned, the Hyperledger fabric will distribute it to the other nodes automatically in the standard way. So if, uh, all of that happens automatically for you. Just a quick piece of that all sounds great. How do we do this um, to write a class um, in Go? And I should make a note that theoretically you could actually write it in multiple languages. And even in your inheritance tree, you could have one class impl implemented in one language and an ancestor class implemented in another language. We will actually build something like that at some point we've done in the past. This was to get a proof of concept out as fast as possible. Um, you write your implementation piece in just class name .go. The These are, of course, conventional names. You don't have to do them exactly that. It's just easier when you're looking at your code. In your class implementation file, maintains uh, data type definitions, a method table, which is used from message name to method resolution, the implementations, which are the actual code that's called to execute it, and some boilerplate that's required to load and run the class. Uh, the stub file is what's created and you, you, you create these things yourself at the moment, although in the future we would expect to create uh, some of this with auto code generation. The stub file is what other classes use to compile against to send messages to your uh, two instances of your class. And the skeleton file is what's received. Uh, so the class major infrastructure expects a stub file and a skeleton file. The class major infrastructure will call into the skeleton file with the method to call and the method will act, the skeleton file will actually then call the correct method. Um, you write this code by hand at some, at some point, like I said, we will automate it. You can see an instance of this in our um, open source. Um, if I don't forget, I'll, if I, because I'll probably forget to say it, um, uh, xbomb.io is our website where you can register and then go pull down the <clears throat> open source for this. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do here, instead of going to this piece, again, we're trying to keep this short, is I'm going to actually uh, bring up and do a quick uh, example of this loading. If you'll give me one second. I have to start up my, we run on um, a, uh, a remote desktop on um, AWS. Hold on one second. Load. Look. And where's the share for this? Do, 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 do. I gotta stop share and start sharing, right? Yeah, here we go. Share screen and go. Okay, you should be able to see my uh, screen. Um, what I've done up to this point, I'm using straight, um, this is actually a modified uh, test network script. So I'm actually in the uh, test network of the fabric samples. If you install Hyperledger Fabric, do a quick um, so the demonstration of that. The original uh, shell script, uh, which was here, network.sh, we've modified slightly to class manager.sh. What we've done so far is just loaded up the, you can just see up here, I've just loaded up the uh, blockchain itself. So we have two peer nodes in an order are running. So, and um, you can see this as Docker containers. Here's the Docker's running. Um, I'll come back in a second. We, um, 
we did not change any of the source code for Hyperledger Fabric whatsoever. What we did need to do is build our own Docker images because the default um, pure nodes for uh, Hyperledger Fabric are built with um, uh, Linux images that do not dynamically, do not enable dynamic loading of shared objects. Technically in Linux, that, Linux, that means that you need what's called the ld-linux.so uh, library. And so what we did is simply change the uh, root uh, Linux kernel that's uh, built into the Docker images. Um, the reason it unfortunately makes the image larger than the uh, very small ones that are done for um, Hyperledger right now, but it doesn't change any of the source code, any of the functionality of Hyperledger. So now what we're going to do is we're going to run our bootstrap. And because um, we want to uh, make the ledger object ease, which you'll see in a minute, uh, deterministic rather than random, um, we have a flag uh, which I've highlighted called um, LOID. Let me paste it over here. Um, that gives you uh, a, um, you can put a random value in there every time you restart the Hyperledger uh, blockchain. So you'd always have uh, completely uh, uh, unique numbers within it, any given chain. Um, for test purposes, we want it to be deterministic so I can run scripts. So this forces a default value, that's all. What this is doing, here's our bootstrap. So this is now creating all the bootstrap classes. I have a nice, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, simple return message, all objects saved there. That means that all of the classes, which are objects that are for the bootstrap environment have now been stored into the blockchain so that all the nodes can use them. It means it did this standard thing, sent out all the transactions um, to the nodes. And that's what the piece does here and signed them, then sent it back out. This uh, peer capability does standard invoke. All this, by the way, we are using the, the um, as you can see, the chain code invoke command from the command line for this. So everything's standard here. Next one would be, now I'm going to actually get the root dictionary. And this is a built-in function because you need to bootstrap from somewhere. And this, that's what this does. And this will return the ledger object ID for my root dictionary. Ledger object ID, we return as printable numbers, but this is, of course, a SHA-256. You could put this as uh, hex, uh, you know, I could print this out in hex as well, just have me printing out as integers and expected as integers, but you could just easily change that. Now I'm going to go get the uh, system account object, which is the um, object we were talking about a minute ago. in the uh, tree I was, I was showing earlier. You need the ledger object ID for that. So you need to go collect those two starting point ledger object IDs to do anything. I now have something that I can send a message to task things of. And so now I'm going to send the first message. Messages are object send, um, and there's something also called object call, which is internal to the runtime, but object send is, you're saying send this message Here's the, actually, it's easier to see it in the black. I think, you know, let me bring that over there. And this is, uh, as I said, the style of making a call. It's a couple more steps and we'll be there. I, even, I forgot you can't see the other window, sorry. So in this environment, we have class manager invoke, the arguments, here's object send. Here's the ledger object ID for the account right here, all the way across. Here's the ledger object ID of the object we're sending the message to. Here's the uh, a method string, the name of the method we're sending, which is class dictionary get object by name. And here's the parameter for the input arguments. We're looking for the root account manager, which is an object instance that's been created to now be able to ask it to go make a new account for me. And so it's going to go send that message, hit return. And what it's done right here is now returned to me the object handle of the 
um, object I want, which is root account manager. So I now have an object that I can now send a message to. The message I'm going to send, I'll put that in two in one second, is to create a new account. Copy, here it comes. And what this does, so here's again, here's another message. Here's, an, here's the account uh, um, object. Here's the target object right here. And you'll notice that this is the same as right here, which was returned. So I'm literally, I got the object. Now I'm going to send a message to it. And now what I'm asking it to do, because I know that it inherits from class factory, I'm saying, make a new object. That's a message that is implemented in class factory. And so we'll inherit it. And uh, the argument it takes is a, how many should I make? And of course, I only want to make one at the moment. And it is now made an object. And here's the handle returned again, ledger object ID. If you notice a, a little unique piece right here, there's a double bracket. This is because this would actually return an array of objects if I asked it to make multiple. So I could actually, um, it's a class factory, but I happen to make accounts right here. So I could say to the account manager, make me a whole bunch of accounts of this account type. And one more piece. So I now have an object and uh, the object is an account. It doesn't actually contain anything. It's a very short demo. Um, but it, obviously I could add new objects to it. The interesting thing is how do I know what the methods are, what the classes are an object inherits from and what the methods are for those objects? What we added in is the ability for inspection and return back JSON schema so you know how to send messages to it. And so the message that I want to demo for that is simply one that called, um, and this implemented in the root class object, so all classes have it, all objects have it rather, class object inspect, which is going to return, looks like a very ugly piece of, of uh, text. But in fact, this is, if you pretty print this, you will see that this is standard JSON schema, and that it walks up the entire class tree and gives you all of the um, methods in all of the arguments in JSON syntax that you can use to send to every single class that the objects inherit from. So I can interrogate any object, whether it's an object, a class, or a meta class, and retrieve this information. So it gives you a very dynamic way to um, manage. Uh, you could build dynamic user interfaces from it and things like that. Um, that's as far as I want to go. Um, uh, please take a look at xbomb.io. When you register on that, it will give you the link to the, um, what we call HLF XBOM public, uh, Fiber Ledger Fabric XBOM public uh, GitLab. And you can uh, pull that down. There's a script to set up your environment um, in a Linux environment. We don't do Windows and it will come up and run for you. Um, and it's the same environment I use. Thank you very much. I do see there's a lot of questions. I'll try to pull some up and look at them. And let me stop sharing. And Mike, if you want to take over, I'll, I'll take a look at the messages. Okay. Thank you very much, Dave, for that. Um, I am going to uh, share one last time. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, slideshow yes, from the current. Okay. There. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, yes. And hear me. Okay. Let me close that up. Okay. So um, the last thing that there was one question that came in, I saw on uh, is this open source? So there's two parts to this um, for the developer. Uh, for the developer community, absolutely 100%. This is the class code in order to build classes and, uh, uh, and offer. Uh, it, you can commercialize anything. Um, those classes, uh, those can, your, your uh, vertical specific class trees that you make, whatever, figure those are your applications. Yes, that is open source. Um, we don't expect any royalties, any revenue or anything from anything you create there. 
What's not open source is what the CMI, the class manager infrastructure, and that will be a SaaS license to the enterprise. This is not something that we're looking for uh, uh, to the developers um, uh, to uh, uh, bear any uh, costs on. Um, we do have a channel pro uh, uh, also set up so that there is uh, um, uh, channel opportunities in order to uh, participate with the organization. Um, again, the class manager infrastructure is a, uh, a, a monthly SaaS license uh, to the enterprise. The class build code uh, is fully open source um, with no need to uh, add to the project. Your, your, whatever you build is not open source. Um, that is fully commercialized for you. Um, okay, so next steps. Um, you know, we are starting, we are looking for proof of concept now. We are working with a couple of different organizations um, here in the United States. Uh, um, we're looking for uh, application and projects uh, and, uh, you know, for, and, and the team uh, to kind of work with. Uh, document the proof of concept objectives and then work with us on the POC design and testing. Uh, we, we understand that uh, it, it, it's a new way to look at, uh, uh, at the architecture of blockchain and such. So we're definitely um, here to uh, assist in, in any way that we can. So um, as Dave said, uh, xbomb.io, uh, you can go to xbomb.io and uh, oops, and uh, register uh, for access into our GitLab uh, repository where you can download the code uh, and play with it. We have on xbomb.io, the overview page towards the bottom are three videos that go deep into uh, the overview, the functional overview of xbomb on Hyperledger, um, goes into the concept of accounts and class or classes and objects and then finally uh, into the JSON uh, um, environment that uh, Dave uh, built. And, uh, you know, um, Telegram, Prasago Official. Um, we also have uh, the Telegram chat, and I believe this uh, presentation will be available um, after uh, to everybody, so you can use the links there. Uh, we do have currently support for uh, developers is through our Telegram uh, um, developer channel, which is the yeah. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Non one. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Michael. So uh, thank yes. you, Michael. Very important question regarding the x -bomb and the, uh, I think you also may be aware like DML and the kind of accord project. So another person was asking about how you will relate your x -bomb with the, the digital asset and the uh, that account project because they also put some kind of abstraction at the chain code level writing. I, you know, I, I'm sorry, I did not hear that question. Can you ask one more, Dave? Did you? Or... I'm asking, uh, there, there is a digital. I guess there's some network issues at Kamlesh. Yeah, so there layer, is a question like on you are the, the QA portal. Yeah. Yeah, there is a question on the Q&A portal, which they're asking, how can we relate XBOM versus other solutions like what we see in DAML? Uh, Dave, I'll let you answer that on the uh, DAML uh, question. So I'm not sure what you're, oh, is that DAML is what you're talking about? Yeah, right. Oh, okay. Um, so the uh, key difference for the um, XBOM environment um, for virtually anything else you've seen in the, uh, uh, any sort of smart contract or chain code or any other name for blockchain is that the class code, in, in, or in this case, actually the reference to the class code um, is actually stored on the blockchain. So a class isn't, exists as an object itself. And so the instance data to a class includes telling you what the method, methods that it'll take are, how to call the code, and in the environment with Go, it also tells you where to go find the actual uh, plugins. But if it was in something where you're running an interpreted language, it would include the interpreted code itself. When you uh, do an instantiate an object, it will walk up the class tree, and those are literally looking up the blockchain for each class, which is an object for reference to another class up its inheritance tree. 
So you only ever, if you're adding, for example, new capability, yeah, yeah. you're adding just a subclass. You're not um, uh, recompiling the entire in, uh, environment to do a single image. So it's a, a different concept from. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, go Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Michael and David, for the your uh, detailed technical presentation. is really nice and informative. So and now we have a next presentation from Santil. And okay. Santil is um, uh, going to talk about private data collection. And if you don't know the Santil, Santil is a from the IBM research and contributor to the Hyperledger fabric. And he also maintains his blog. Uh, he generally writes about the Hyperledger fabric and its concepts in detail. And who started uh, Hyperledger fabric following, then he must be no uh, Santil. Santil, over to you. Uh, Santil. Santil, can you? Uh, Arun, Santil is there? Hey, Kamlesh, I don't see Santil um, on the panel. Let's oh, contact maybe, him. Maybe he dropped, I think. I see him joining. Yeah, he, he just. Yeah. yeah, hi, Kamlesh. Sorry, I, mean, uh, I think uh, my. Uh, Zoom got crashed. Okay, let Okay, yeah. So uh, I just introduced you. Okay. So uh, yeah. take forward. Start the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kamlesh, for the introduction. Uh, so this talk is about uh, private data collection and hyperledger fabric, and uh, this is available uh, since version one point two. And this was anyway done uh, in collaboration with other fabric maintainer, Manish Shethi, Dave Inyarat, and Yako and Autumn. So this is the agenda of the talk. Uh, so first I will present the transaction flow involving just the public data. Uh, then I will present motivation for uh, providing data privacy within the channel. Then I will explain uh, how the private data transaction flow works in uh, fabric including private data dissemination and how to define private data collection for a chain code. Uh, then the, uh, definitely there would be a questions like uh, how channel and private data compare to each other and what are the pros and cons, uh, when one should use channel and when one should use private data collection. So I will talk about that. Uh, then I will dive into some of the implementation details. Uh, so more like an internal. Uh, to show that how uh, the code execute when there is a public data and the how code execute when there is a private data, especially for the commit path. Then I will talk about some of the performance numbers with private data collection and uh, some of the optimizations that we have been doing and uh, some we are planning to do it in the future to improve the numbers. And finally, I will conclude with some ongoing work. Okay, let's look at uh, uh, public data transaction flow. Uh, so I'm assuming that uh, the audience are aware of uh, smart contract, endorsement, and then state DB, some background on Hyperledger fabric. Um, so here in this setup, I have four organizations, A, B, C, and D, and uh, each of them is hosting an peer, and then there is a state database. And uh, just for an example, there is a smart contract called ES that is hosted on all the organization. And we have clients, and we also have an ordering service. And in the right hand side, it's just a committer only peer, which does not run any smart contract. So let's say that organization B wants to submit a transaction. Uh, basically, it is trying to put uh, store a value like uh, account ID and then balance for that account ID. And uh, depending on the endorsement policy for the smart contract, it actually stores the, I mean, it submits the uh, transaction to the organizations. Then the transaction is simulated on the respective organization. Then the simulation results as well as organization digital signature is sent back to the client. So the simulation results include many things, including the transaction message submitted by the client. But for us, the key thing is the right set. So it also includes the read set, but for simplicity, I have assumed that the smart contract is not doing any read. So, uh, as a response to the uh, simulation, it just uh, uh, give the right set. Right set includes the account ID and then the balance number. And the digital signature is nothing but the endorsement here. 
then organization i mean the client collects uh, enough endorsement and then submit the simulation results and all endorser signature for ordering and then orderer perform consensus to create a block of transaction then the block is delivered uh, to all the members connected to the channel then uh, the block is opened and then for each uh, transaction first uh, the endorsement policy validator is invoked to validate against the smart contract endorsement policy so if you remember uh, the client collected uh, signatures right so that need to match the uh, endorsement policy defined for the smart contract so if that is valid then it goes into mvcc validation it's basically a, a validation uh, to uh, ensure serializability isolation uh, in simple we can uh, think of it like a double spend uh, detector and if it detects something like that it will invalidate the transaction uh, basically what it does is there is a read set and then there is a version for each key it basically checks any of the read has been modified or not uh, it's it's a simple right if i have read some data and then decided to make some modification but before the commit if the read data has been changed then obviously i cannot commit the data because the logic uh, might give me a different output if i execute the program now so that's why that's what the mvcc validation does if it is valid then the transaction would be committed and uh, then the transaction status would be sent back to the client so this is the basic uh, how the public data works in hyperledger fabric so uh, in this setup there is a need for data privacy uh, let's take a, a, a sample uh, blockchain solution that is a supply chain network especially here i am taking a food supply chain network assume that there is a chocolate uh, manufacturer uh, then uh, for that i mean if i take the for the overall supply chain network there has to be a farmer who is delivering the raw materials then obviously there will be a wholesale uh, seller because the manufacturer may not directly buy from the uh, farmers because the wholesaler take care of contacting multiple farmers then there could be multiple distributors uh, and then different uh, retailers okay uh, so let's say that uh, let's for example let's take a single farmer supplier manufacturer distributor and retailer and uh, they uh, form a consortium and then uh, start a, a blockchain network in hyperledger fabric uh, so each of them could run a peer okay and uh, so we need not to go into the individual detail like what are the actions that can be possible um, so these all these actions are recorded in the blockchain and the key thing is um, so in hyperledger fabric as we saw uh, when a transaction is added to a block the block is replicated to all the members so every member get to see the data so especially if you see invoice and proof of payment these are like very sensitive data and uh, for example uh, if uh, if the invoice sent to manuf manufacturer by the supplier is visible to the distributor then distributor can kind of calculate the profit or even the farmer can do the same so those data we cannot directly store it and uh, one simple solution is to only store the hash so just to store the hash of the invoice or hash of the proof of payment and then we need to manage an external store and then keep the actual data and then worry about the synchronization between the data that is present in the blockchain and then data that is present in the offline store that add lot of uh, additional overheads and even the smart contract cannot directly access the data uh, that is present outside the the peer so the naive solution doesn't work so uh, if we think about it uh, in a high level uh, what kind of solution that we need is so between the farmer and supplier uh, we kind of need a store that will store uh, some sensitive sensitive information that should be seen only by uh, those two entity similarly for every two entity i need some kind of uh, private data store so that would definitely solve the problem right like a high level idea and then in the replicated ledger we could store like order id product id lot id and that could in fact be referred back to the uh, private data collection if i do hash of order id probably i can get the invoice for that order id in the uh, the former supplier private data this is a high level concept um, so let's look at uh, what is the exact uh, transaction flow uh, that uses private data so i am i am taking the same example uh, but now you would see uh, two uh, new boxes one is uh, private ab uh, so here uh, in this example what i am assuming is that 
there is a private collection between organization A and B. Any data that is stored in the private A and B will be only visible to these two organizations and it wouldn't be visible to other organizations. And then there is something called transient DB, right? That's more like an internal store. Uh, when I explain the transaction flow, uh, things would become uh, very clear why the transient DB is used. So let's take the same example. Um, so it's a storing of a balance for an account, account ID. And the simulation tra of transaction happens. Here, uh, in the simulation, what exactly happens is that the account ID and balance is actually returned to the transient DB. And then when the simulation result is sent back to the client, it only includes the hash of account ID and then the hash of balance because this is going to be included in the block and the block is going to be distributed to all the organization. So if I store the plain account ID and balance, then everybody would uh, get to see the value, right? So that's why it kind of, I, uh, sorry. Uh, so in the step two, the actual value was stored in the transient DB and then only the hash of the value is sent to the client so that uh, it will be sent to the ordering service for order. Then the ordering happens, block is created and then block is delivered. So here the validation happens as usual. And then there is a new step, which is called a fetch private data. So uh, when we talk about implementation, uh, you will find out that when exactly the step eight is executed. Uh, so basically each peer would check, uh, so whether this transaction has a private data hash uh, in the right set, if it has a hash, then it will check whether it is belonging to that collection or not. So if it is belonging to the collection, it knows that, okay, then there is there should be some private data in the transient DB. So it will try to fetch the private data from the transient DB. So if you remember in uh, step two, we actually stored the account ID and then the, let me show that as well. So in the step two, we stored it right in the transient DB. And then in step, uh, step eight, it has been fetched. Then the MVCC validation happens. Again, it happens on the account ID and then the balance because that is only is present in all the other organization as well. Then the commit happens. So at the end, uh, you could see that in the private collection A and B, the plain account ID and balance would be present, whereas the hash of the account ID and the balance would be available at all the organization uh, uh, database. So this is how the private data collection works. So if there are any questions, uh, I'd like to take it. So there is a question, is the trust is compromised to the privacy or other way of technology? Access trust versus privacy of information to... Yeah, so Bala has to ask some question related to a uh, trust. Uh, so, so basically here, uh, see for example, in a blockchain network, suppose say there is a four uh, a member that is present in a consortium, uh, especially the example that I gave, uh, if there are competitors or uh, present in a single channel, then obviously uh, nobody trusts, right? Because the competitor could uh, read my data. So even if there is some kind of trust, I don't want to take that uh, risk. So the consensus in blockchain is mainly doing ordering. It's not really, a, 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 I mean, uh, the agreement, etc. It's simple ordering of transaction. So I wouldn't uh, put a uh, trust on the cons uh, consensus. It's basically the ordering node is malicious or not. Uh, and uh, can we achieve privacy by using IPFS? Yeah, so one of the key, uh, the reason for adding private data collection is that we do not want to rely on any of the external services to store the, uh, the actual data and then store the hash in the blockchain because then the smart contract cannot access the data that is present in the IPFS or any other uh, data environment, right? Especially we did not want to do that. So that's, uh, that's our main goal to keep the private data collection within the fabric. Still, if somebody wants to uh, use IPFS, they could do it, but they need to ensure that the smart contract is able to access the external world. Mm. So Sunil has asked a question. Can you mention the read, write, and double spend version validation for updating uh, private data? Okay. Uh, so similar to public data, uh, private data. So there, as I said, there is a hash, right? A hash of the key and then the hash of the value that is stored in the uh, public DB. Okay. Even this entries has a version number associated with it. So when a data is being read, 
it actually uh, adds to the read set what is the hash of the key and then what is the version it read and then during the mvcc validation because even the non member has the hash of the key they can actually validate whether the version has been changed or not so when we have a private data it doesn't mean that other people does not have any information about it but note that other people still have the hash of the content and we can associate any uh, version number with it and we can do the mvcc validation and how is the concurrency uh, handled while ordering if two org sends update to the same account id okay uh, so cu currently the ordering service does not uh, peek into the transaction so ordering service just to receive a, a set of bytes and then uh, the one main thing that it does is access control whether the uh, the submitter uh, of the transaction is allowed to uh, uh, write to a channel or not and then it creates the block and then send the block to the peer and then in the peer there is mvcc validation right currently we do it very sequentially so we take a transaction perform mvcc validation and then put the write set into a memory buffer and then we do the next uh, uh, transaction validation so currently it kind of serial so that kind of provide a serial disability isolation level what is the impact of uh, business reporting okay so um, so but when i talk about private data collection obviously i don't want to show my data to others right so obviously uh, they shouldn't do any analytics on my private data uh, so that's that's my main goal uh, that's why it's, i'm using private data collection so obviously uh, that wouldn't be supported okay no more questions so i will uh, move on so um, next is the private data dissemination uh, there is a push versus pull protocol um, and the way that how the private data is shared between the members so there are two scenarios first i will explain when the push of private data happens and when the pull happens okay so let's take uh, an a setup in which uh, the smart contract has an endorsement policy saying or a and then or b okay and then there is a collection uh, with the member a and b and uh, when the organization b is submitting a transaction because the the, the endorsement policy says that to i mean uh, the, the client can submit the transaction to any one of the organization it is submitting to organization a so now uh, the the simulation of transaction actually stores the private data into the transient db of let me take the like yeah so it stores the actual uh, private data into the transient db of our ga but our b uh, doesn't have that uh, private data yet, right so in the push protocol what happens is that uh, at the end of the simulation and the private data is pushed to, to the other member of the collection so it pushes the account id and then balance number to the other organization and store it in the transient db so during that uh, validation and commit of a block the organization b also can get the private data so that's the push protocol and in pull pull protocol uh, suppose say that um, the organization b is kind of unreachable in the case one uh, then at the uh, eighth step when it is fetching the private data uh, it will try to fetch from the transient db but the transient db would return nil because the data is not available at the time it will pull it from the other member and then it uh, do the commit so that's how the push and pull happens usually pull should be avoided uh, it's only uh, used when there is a network isolation or uh, there is i mean the organization b is able to talk to the ordering service but it is not able to talk to organization a to fetch the data through push or pull protocol so only at the time the pull would be used otherwise it shouldn't be there is also something called missing private data i will uh, cover that in a very uh, brief way so let's look at how to define private data collection for a chain code uh, so this is the sample uh, a json in which we pass it along with when we instantiate the chain code uh, so first thing is the name that is the name of the collection and the policy is basically a num members of the collection and there is a required peer count that actually decides to how many number of peers Uh, the private data need to be pushed at the end of endorsement and the block to live is nothing but uh, for how long the data that is stored in the collection should be alive so this uh, feature was mainly introduced for uh, gdpr requirement because in gdpr uh, there is a requirement for uh, 
keeping the data alive only for a short duration. After that, the data need to be removed. But because we don't have the time concept in Hyperledger Fabric, so we kind of use block number. That is a block height as the lifetime of the data. And uh, max peer count is again uh, something related to the uh, uh, push protocol. And then there is a member only read and member only write. I will talk about it shortly. So for a chain code, uh, we can uh, have any number of collections. Uh, so there is no limit. Uh, but however, there is a some physical limit based on the system resources and uh, how many database uh, CouchDB can handle. But I mean, in order to create like four uh, uh, collections, we need to have the four kind of uh, this structure like name policy and all other parameters so uh, in 1.x um, so we didn't have a, a endorsement policy for collection uh, whereas in 2.0 that we have introduced so here i'm talking about why we have introduced that so let's take a scenario um, where there is a chain called called uh, mycc and that is deployed on arg1 arg2 and then arg3 okay and there is a collection A and in which ARG1 and ARG2 are the members. And the endorsement policy says that any one organization can uh, uh, submit a transaction here. So, uh, so given that there is a collection A and that holds a private data associated with ARG1 and ARG2 only, uh, I mean, it's basically we cannot allow ARG3 to write anything into collection one, right? So because it's a store belongs to ARG1 and ARG2. Uh, however, uh, before 1.x, if uh, chain code hasn't returned any uh, sophisticated access control, uh, definitely R3 could submit a simulation request to R2 and then can uh, write into collection A. Or the R3 peer could manually create that, uh, I mean, even the client could manually create the transaction uh, write set and then uh, put the signature of the peer because the R3 has access to the peer and they can submit the transaction to add data to a collection A. Uh, so we didn't want that. So that's why in 2.0, we introduced a separate endorsement for policy for the collection. Uh, so that in collection A, uh, we need to define endorsement policy with R1 and R2 as a member so that R3 cannot do any transaction on a collection A. So uh, we have three levels of endorsement policy. As you know, chain code endorsement policy is there then collection endorsement policy is what I uh, defined. And more fine-grained is the uh, key-based endorsement policy. So that this endorsement policy also, we need to define as part of uh, uh, this configuration. Okay, so uh, let's talk about read-write uh, uh, access control on collection. Uh, this is like an inbuilt, implicit uh, read-write access control. Uh, still user can, add read write access control uh, by adding a code to the smart contract uh, but we added some feature uh, to the the configuration itself so that the peer itself enforces uh, access control so um, the same example same scenario uh, now say that arc3 client uh, i mean in 1.x arc3 client can submit a, a simulation request to read some data from collection a uh, if the smart contract hasn't implemented any access control on uh, collection A. So this kind of leaks uh, some of the private data, right? So that's why in uh, 2.0, we introduced something called member, member only read and then member only write. So member only read, uh, if it is set to true, the peer itself will check whether the submitter of the transaction is a member of a collection. If it is not, it will reject the transaction. It will throw error. So earlier, the smart contract need to make this check because that every smart contract need to have this code. We kind of uh, made that code integrated into peer itself. Similarly, there is a member only write as well. Okay, and uh, in 2.0, we also introduced other uh, APIs like uh, get private data hash, uh, especially this is used for uh, moving data from one collection to another, but I'm not covering them in details, but in Fabric sample uh, recently, uh, there is a separate uh, uh, use case uh, dedicated for uh, this API as well as uh, implicit collection. So uh, implicit collection is like uh, whenever a chain code is instantiated, by default, uh, there is an implicit collection with uh, the peer as the, I mean, member. It's like a, so for example, so here there is a chain code MyCC that is deployed on three organization, right? 
So by default, uh, the arc one has an implicit collection, and then arc two also has a collection, arc three also has a collection. Only the respective organization can write data to it. Okay, and uh, this kind of add a lot more privacy, and uh, so that's what. So I, I probably you should look at a fabric sample because this itself will take. Uh, I mean, more time to cover. So that's why I'm deferring uh, to Fabric Sample Repo if anyone is interested in learning more about implicit collection and how to use uh, Git private data hash. Okay, uh, so before that, if there are any questions. So there is a question from Rajit. Uh, if you are maintaining the private data, then why do we purge the data? Is there any case that data could be purged even when the block to live is uh, set to minus one? So uh, when the block to live uh, value is set to zero, uh, we do not purge the private data at all. And uh, so the first question is like, if I mean, if you are maintaining private data, why we need to purge it, right? Uh, suppose say that I am storing some customer data. Uh, into the blockchain and then the later the customer comes and says that remove my data so that's the gdpr use case so the customer can ask any time to uh, remove the data but uh, we didn't have that feature like uh, when you say that remove the data uh, we we can we could immediately remove it but we didn't do that so instead what we did is we provided a block to leave so whenever the data is stored uh, the user can specify i mean like uh, this data will be alive in the blockchain for like a month depending on the, the block block height or block addition rate. Um, okay, so there is a follow-up as well. I mentioned this because by mistake we had to set tones to prepare, but the gossip was not happening properly. Yeah, so uh, usually the gossip, uh, I mean, whenever the people set up the private data for the first time, definitely there would be some error related to gossip because uh, when there is no private data usage, uh, there is one configuration like uh, the endpoint, gossip endpoint that we need not to set. But especially when we are using private data and the private data is pushed and then pulled, so that parameter need to be set. So because of that, because it doesn't need in the public transaction and only it is needed in the private transaction, uh, usually people misses that configuration. As a result, the data is not usually pushed to the other member. So if the configuration is set uh, properly, then it should work. And I think recently the documentation is also updated to reflect that. So, okay, uh, next question, how the client app get an access to the endorsement policy? So there is something called a service discovery. And uh, there is also some API associated with the uh, service discovery at the SDK. And the application can use those API to find out what is the endorsement policy for a given collection or the chain code. And even they can find out that whether the chain code is deployed on a particular peer or not, et cetera. So the service discovery is the uh, place to look for. I mean, if you need to know about the endorsement policy. And uh, Sunil, uh, would you talk about adding a new org into private collection as on need to know basis and how would this uh, sync up work? Okay. Uh, so when I talk about the implementation, uh, so I will uh, talk about how we are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, doing that uh, in the implementation side. But uh, in addition to that, I'm not talking uh, explicitly about adding new org. But we can add new org and the new org could pull the data from the, the block one to the current block height. But I will talk about it briefly because you asked that when I talk, when, when that slide comes. So then one more question, what type of collection is uh, private data stored in? Is it similar to state DB code stew? Yes. Um, so the data is still uh, stored in the state DB only. Uh, so wherever the public data is stored, in the same place we are storing this uh, private data as well. It's just a separate namespace. So each key is just a prefixed with the collection name. That's it. Uh, there is no other uh, fancy thing. Uh, then, there is another long question, but that looks like a debugging question, so that uh, I may not be able to answer it here. I think it's from Galaxy M30. Sorry, probably we can take it offline because I need to look at it. It looks a uh, little big. Okay, let me go into the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
sorry that is i mean the heading is wrong it should be like a comparison of uh, uh, comparison between channel and the private data collection um, so uh, let's uh, look at uh, when to use channel and then when to use private data collection so i have given the table so for your use case you need to decide uh, by looking at the table uh, so what is uh, suitable uh, for the use case that you are addressing so channel actually provide a transaction level privacy so that's like a best privacy i would say because the participant information is completely hidden the data is also hidden uh, because one channel cannot uh, see all the data that is present in another channel unless the members are like uh, i mean overlapped and the, even the smart contract invoked wouldn't be visible because it doesn't have access to the block whereas in private data collection only data privacy is provided but still uh, the other member can see who has performed this transaction which smart contract got invoked and uh, what are the parameter that is passed to the smart contract so all those detail is kind of uh, leaking some information and the performance uh, when we use larger number of channels definitely it is going to improve the performance because with the channel uh, there is a parallel processing of blocks so whenever we process blocks in parallel the resource utilization improves as a result the the throughput also increases whereas in private data collection i mean it's i mean it's still a single channel uh, a block uh, commit path and also compared to public data uh, there is a performance degradation so i will talk about it uh, shortly and uh, with the channel there is a data silos whereas with the private data collection there is no data silos because we can change collection membership we can remove a member we can add a member and also we would be able to move uh, data from Uh, one state to another um, one collection to another collection and then um, can we automatically modify more than uh, um, data i mean data present in more than two channels so it's not possible whereas we can do the same thing in the collection so if we can submit a single transaction which can uh, modify more than two collections provided that the endorsement policy is matching so that is one advantage with the collection and development and management complexity is uh, debatable it depends on the individualist uh, what i think because in channel we need to track of number of channels and then peers etc and in collection also we need to keep track of number of collections who are all the members of the collections so in my opinion it's kind of equal okay yeah so let's look at comparison between uh, public and private data commit path so now we will dive into uh, internal uh, implementation details uh, so in the left hand side uh, there is a peer component that is involved only during the public data uh, commit But on the right hand side uh, there are more components because uh, the private data has a more number of databases and then storage components etc so in the normal uh, public data um, so when the block is received by the gossip it is stored it stores the block in the block queue uh, then it takes the block and then give it to the endorsement policy validator which actually validate the uh, transaction based on the smart contract uh, endorsement policy then it goes to the serializability validator for mbcc validation then it comes to committer then committer appends the block into block store then apply the right set into state db and then the index is created in the history database whereas if we if we take private data you can see that there are more components right so one is private right set dissemination so that what uh, is invoked during push and the pull of uh, private data and that is the one which takes care of uh, transient store as well and uh, there is something called missing private data reconciler and uh, this is uh, used in two uh, places one is uh, uh, neither push happened nor pull happened because some network uh, connectivity issue has happened so in that case uh, the missing data would be marked uh, in a private block store like there is a missing eligible status there right so that yeah, entry would be made and then missing private data reconciler pre periodically try to fetch those missing data from other members uh, that that is another new component and then in private block store obviously that is also a new component because now we have a private data uh this is mainly to store historical private uh, uh, data and uh, you could see that there is something called missing ineligible state so this actually stores all the states uh, it's like a hash of all the keys and then the uh, the data that is associated with collection 
for which the peer is not a member currently. So that's why it is storing it as ineligible. Uh, so uh, somebody asked a question, right? I mean, uh, how the, the data is pulled when a new member is added. So when the new member is added, uh, the missing inel ineligible state is moved. Of, I mean, the, the data present in this ineligible state is moved from this bucket to the eligible state bucket. Then the missing private data reconciler will fetch the data from the other members. So that's how the addition of new member also happens. And then there is a purge DB that basically stores uh, uh, the purge uh, entry for each of the key and value if the block value value is non-zero. And then in the state DB, we store public state, hashed state, and then private state. So public and hash states uh, would be same across all the peers because that is present in the block. Whereas private state would vary depending on the collections and uh, whether this peer is a member of the collection, etc. And then there is a history DB and also there is a collection config DB. Uh, this basically stores all historical collection definition for each chain code. This is used during the pull and push. For example, if a new peer is joined, it need to access the historical value. So that's why we have this uh, database. Yeah, so before going further, uh, I would also like to check the time as well as some questions. So Arun, uh, so do we have more uh, time or it's already oh. Arun Kamlesh? So uh, I think since it's a 45 minutes, so how many uh, minutes do you... So, uh, so if you give me 10 more minutes, I will quickly cover the rest of the content. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, uh, let me quickly, okay, I will take questions at the end. Um, so this is the exact uh, block commit path. So I can make the slide available later uh, so that you can actually look at it. Uh, so this covers the exact uh, uh, steps in terms of code uh, that has been called for both uh, public, public data and then the private data. So let's get into performance analysis. So here uh, we use four organization setup. Each peer is each organization is owning a peer, and there is a private data collection with all four organization as a member. So though it's not a realistic one, uh, but for a performance benchmarking, this kind of give a simple setup for us. And uh, still, uh, somebody can use this uh, if they want to hide data from the ordering service. So still, it's a kind of remote valid. Uh, uh, the I mean scenario and we used a small bank uh, benchmark and uh, so you can see there is a different set of uh, APIs are uh, implemented in the chain code and so this is the endorsement policy I mean collection that we have used for our uh, setup and um, so we are uh, I mean all them all all are a member uh, of the collection so that's what I mentioned in the previous uh, day okay let's get into the number um, so in this graph, the x-axis is the millisecond and the y-axis is the throughput uh, that um, achieved. So this millisecond is nothing but the block commit time. So given a, take, given a block, how much time it takes to commit it. Uh, so with the private data, the peak throughput was around 720 TPS, whereas with the public data, we could uh, get around 1,440 TPS, obviously more than 50 percentage drop. Um, but we could improve the performance. So that's what we did. Uh, so we introduced five optimizations. Um, so again, uh, so these are like low level implementation details. So, so I'm covering in a very high level. So we do sting based uh, comparison for membership check instead of uh, uh, doing policy evaluation that we did it in 1.4 and 2.0. And uh, we also purge transient store in background uh, rather than doing it in the uh, critical path. Uh, then uh, the commit to block store and the private data store is, uh, it happened uh, serially, so that we could do it in parallel, but it complicates the recovery mechanism. Similarly, we can commit to both PurgeDB and StateDB in parallel, uh, that also we did, and use a cache at the transient store. Um, so with this optimization, with each individual optimization, I have mentioned uh, what is the maximum throughput that I an mean, improvement that we are getting. So you can see that with all five optimization, we could get till uh, 1,344 TPS. Whereas with the public data, uh, it's uh, 1,440, right? So we kind of close to the performance gap. So only 6% uh, drop in the performance for now. But unfortunately, not all the optimizations are available in Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, 
um, so so i i think uh, first two has been merged uh, the one and two has been merged and the remaining three uh, we are planning to do uh, once the ledger check pointing work is done so probably it will be available uh, yearly next year so you can track those uh, uh, i mean jira items uh, here for the rest of the optimization so currently uh, we could get till 1000 uh, tps with the private data collection whereas with public data it would be like uh, 1400 tps again this is not an official number because the number could uh, vary depending on the mission and then the mission configuration what is the use case and so many other factors this is just for the setup that uh, uh, we have used uh, this is the number we have get okay and uh, this is the one of the main recommendation uh, so whenever you are defining a private data collection uh, ensure that the required peer count and max peer count are set in a way that uh, the push itself is alone so push itself is disseminating the private data there is no need for pull because if you use pull then it could significantly drop the performance like 60 percentage drop in the performance could occur so these need to be uh, set in a proper way and also we need to set something called skip pulling invalid transaction during commit to true so this also helps in improving the performance and uh, yeah so we are uh, doing uh, a more study like uh, when the new member is added uh, so how much time it takes and also if you have a large number of collections uh, how it is going to impact and also performance with implicit collections yeah so if this i will go to questions so vikram uh, so can one or own the collection but other org request access to the data or the particular uh, transaction yes it's kind of possible uh, so for that what we need to do is uh, we need to set uh, the member only read to false when you are defining the collection and then in the chain code you need to manage all the access control so even you could have a chain code managed state to decide when to dynamically allow permission for a particular member for example you could uh, store some secret into the chain code uh, and then you can share the secret with the other member and when the other member shared the secret you can allow that member to read the data from the chain code so that that's kind of is possible and sunil uh, the underlying transaction log would be different for our inside private data collection and for our outside the collection having only but both being part of the chain channel yeah so if you look at the log the log is just the block store right that is the block so the block would be same across all the peers so the block because we compute hash so there is a hash chain that shouldn't change at all so that's why i said that we always include hash of the key and then the hash of the value in the block that would be consistent across all the node only the state db data could vary so some peer could have the private data and some peer would not have the private data but still the block store being the source of truth that would be consistent across all the peers and what was the block size during the performance test that was the 100 Uh, block size and what exactly the purge db and the history db purpose i hope the state db will be referred for and read write set for validation so can you please cl clarify that point okay uh, so the purge db what it actually stores is the the purge schedule for each key value stored in the private data collection so suppose say we defined a private data collection with the block to live as uh, 10 it means that any key value that i store in the private data collection will be alive in the uh, peer only for till the next 10 blocks okay so uh, in the purge db we kind of create an entry saying that uh, on the 20th uh, block commit this key need to be removed from the state db so that's the purge db uh, work so it basically stores all the entry that need to be removed whenever a block commit happens so the, that's what the purge db uh, work is and uh, the history db is basically a index to the block store uh, so there is a get history for key uh, there is a api right so using that api uh, we could uh, get history of his all value for a given key so it's basically a indexing to a, a block store it's like a which file and then which offset etc so that's uh, not exactly the complete uh, store Uh, yeah so i think uh, there are no more questions there is one more question so what is the block time for the performance test that's one second so
So all the performance tests I do, or I keep it at uh, one second because we also uh, measure the performance like uh, uh, throughput per second, right? So so one second is good for reporting performance numbers. Is it not uh, advisable to use get private data query result while using private data, keeping the purge in mind? Yes, yes, that's true. And uh, even uh, so, there could be missing private data also, right? Uh, for example, if network partition has happened, uh, then the the matching data would not be present in the state DB. So even in that case, the get private data query wouldn't return. Even when there is a purge, it may not return all the data. So that's why with uh, very clear, I mean careful uh, design, we need to assign the block to live and the other data. But you are correct, yes. Yeah, thank you, Santil. Santil. Yes, thanks for coming. Yeah, it's really nice and so much deep technical. Yeah. Like your blog. Oh, thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So uh, next we have uh, uh, Muhammad Usama Sadar, and uh, uh, he's going to talk about how the attestation work in the Hyperledger Avalon. And Hyperledger Avalon is a trusted execution framework compute framework, uh, which is based on the Intel SGX uh, CPUs where you run the, you are some kind of services and programs in the CPU enclave memory, uh, some kind of privacy features. So uh, over to you, Mohammed. Thank you very much. Uh, so can you hear me clearly? Yeah, very clear. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so let me share the slides. Um, okay, so let's start. Um, so I'm Osama and um, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, formal foundations for attestation in Hyperledger Avalon. And uh, if you're not familiar with any of these three terms, I mean, this formal foundations or attestation or hyperledger of loan, I will give a brief overview. And uh, this work is under the supervision of Professor Christoph Fetzer. And I would also like to thank my colleagues, Rasha, Do, Franz, and Said, who were uh, involved in this work. So, um, the outline basically uh, is that uh, I will introduce uh, the three terms that I just men mentioned in the title. And uh, afterwards, I will uh, describe about some related work which has been done in this domain. And uh, thirdly, I will talk about the current att attestation mechanism which is used in uh, uh, Avalon, which is called as EPID. And, uh, the future attestation mechanism, which is currently being developed, uh, 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 currently being integrated in Avalon, which is called as DCAP. I will describe that briefly. And finally, I will uh, describe uh, the formalism that we used uh, in order to analyze that. Okay, so uh, briefly about Hyperledger Avalon. Uh, unlike the three talks uh, that you have attended, um, it is a ledger independent tool uh, which supports uh, Fabric and Ethereum, for example, and uh, at the moment. And uh, it, the main aim of uh, this uh, tool is basically to improve the blockchain scalability and the transaction confidentiality. How this is done? This is done by implementing the off-chain trusted compute specification, which is published by the Enterprise uh, Ethereum Alliance. And uh, there are uh, different kinds of trusted compute uh, possible, which are supported. For instance, zero knowledge proof and multi-party compute and trusted execution environment. Trusted execution environment is the solution which is selected for implementing uh, Avalon. And there are reasons for that. So I will explain when I talk about uh, trusted execution environments. And before that, I would like to talk about uh, the security paradigms and why is it important or what is new in this. So the data security uh, domains, if you look at very high level, it consists of uh, three main paradigms. The first one is the data at rest. Uh, for instance, the data which is residing in uh, your hard disk the second one is uh, the data in transit, for instance, in untrusted public networks. And um, 
The third one really is the new paradigm, which is the data in use, which when we have some computations being done on the data, and this is really critical because uh, you need, uh, for the most part, applications need to have the data in the clear in order to operate or in order to do some operations or th on them. So that is why it is uh, important. So hardware-based trusted execution environments basically are the hardware-based techniques uh, to isolate the data from the untrusted entities, which involve uh, not only the OS, but also uh, uh, other uh, untrusted entities. Um, for instance, this is really important when you have uh, a an application and you want to run it in an untrusted uh, environment, such as a public cloud. And then you need to have some isolated uh, environment be created for the computations to remain confidential. And this is really where uh, trusted execution environments are uh, good and uh, various solutions have been proposed. For instance, Intel SEX, um, uh, AMD Secure Processor, ARM Trust Zone. So these are the three uh, major solutions for trusted execution environments. Avalon uh, currently uses Intel SEX for the implementation. Right, so what, what is attestation and why is it so important in Intel SCX? Uh, attestation is roughly a way of giving trust to the challenger. Uh, the challenger meaning here that when we have the off-chain computations, when we want the blockchain to do some computation off-chain, then uh, that is the challenger basically asking the worker to do that computation and we want that uh, guarantee or kind of a trust that the right application or the right computation is being performed inside the right platform so that uh, we can have uh, these guarantees. And uh, the kind of verification which is done here is uh, for different entities. And one of them uh, is, uh, a major one of them is that uh, we know the identity of the enclave and the enclave representing here the uh, protected region of the memory where the computation is being done. So we verify basically uh, that the identity of the enclave is what we expected. And uh, another important thing is the validity of the platform, that the platform itself on which that computation is being done is, uh, uh, is the correct one, is the right one, and is not under the control of the adversary, or for instance, is not something which is being simulated and giving us the results. So we need to verify that it is the right uh, platform. Uh, this is uh, very important because we need to provision the secrets uh, to the enclave. And uh, before provisioning, we need to have some kind of guarantees that our enclave and the platform are really what we are expecting before we can uh, put our secrets into it. So we uh, need to uh, consider the attestation mechanism. Talking specifically about the attestation in Intel SEX, uh, as I mentioned that uh, Avalon currently uses Intel SEX. Uh, so the attestation process in Intel SEX is of two types. The first one is local attestation where we have two enclaves. Oops, sorry. So we have uh, two enclaves which are uh, inside that platform and they are trying to attest each other that both of them are residing on the same platform. And uh, the second one is a remote attestation when one of these enclaves proves its identity to a remote platform, then uh, this is called as remote attestation. Uh, then we have uh, the two main types of uh, remote attestation as I showed in the outline. So the first one is APID, Enhanced Privacy Identification. And this is what uh, the currently, uh, uh, currently being used in Avalon. Uh, this basically uh, is based on the uh, concept of privacy that your identity remains hidden. And then the second one is uh, more in order to, uh, the, is called uh, DCAP, data center attestation primitives. So this is more in the concept of uh, giving you, uh, making a full infrastructure of attestation where you do not need to contact Intel each time for the verification of your um, uh, verification of your codes. And so what are codes? So I will explain that uh, in the coming slides. 
And the third part of introduction, uh, as I described in the title, there are three things. So the third part is uh, really this formal methods and uh, what uh, they do and why they are so important. So here I have mentioned that they are basically uh, some mathematical techniques which guarantee that the model satisfies its requirements. So we have, uh, we represent the system in mathematical way and then get that it's this model that we created has the uh, satisfies the requirements that are done. So here is a motivation for that, why we need formal methods. There was a security protocol, Needham Schroeder protocol, which was uh, used for 17 years. And then after 17 years, it was discovered that uh, this had a uh, flaw in the protocol. And this was discovered using formal methods. So you can realize that uh, the potential of formal methods in security is really great. And uh, this is really what we uh, are trying to um, do along with the implementation of uh, the Hyperledger Avalon in order to formally guarantee that the system satisfies the requirements. Right, so uh, here I show uh, the flow of uh, what is done inside the four methods in general. We have a system, which is then out of that system, whatever system is given to us, for instance, let's uh, consider this uh, attestation protocol uh, or at a larger scale, the uh, Hyperledger Avalon uh, system. So we create an uh, abstract model of the system which is that basically we have created uh, a mathematical representation of which uh, of the system which we can analyze. And then we have the requirements here, uh, the requirements meaning that what it should satisfy. And what we want is that uh, this should be represented precisely in mathematical form so that it can be verified. So we call it here uh, the specification, meaning that the, they are represented as properties. And finally, what we have is that we check that this abstract model satisfies the satisf uh, specification, sorry. Uh, and if it satisfies, we have some results uh, in the form of uh, a verification proof. And if they do not satisfy, for instance, then we have a counter example, which can show that under this scenario, the system does not satisfy, uh, the model of the system does not satisfy this specification. And then we can go back and check the uh, uh, system model. Was there a problem in the abstract model or was there a problem in the conversion or the translation that we have gone, uh, done in order to model that? And then we can rectify the problem and follow this procedure repeatedly until we get that the proof of the system can be done. So this is the overall um, idea of, uh, of what form methods are. And, um, this kind of work is not new. So there are some related works which have been done specifically related to attestation. And uh, I will uh, briefly describe the two most prominent of them. Uh, the first work was uh, by a group of researchers at UC Berkeley and MIT. Uh, what they did is they proposed some, uh, uh, an abstract way of uh, formalizing attestation. Uh, but specifically, specifically for Intel SEX, they do not provide the proofs and uh, this remains a gap. Then Intel uh, has uh, in some of the documentations mentioned about some of their works that they have done for this and some of the tools that they have uh, utilized in order to uh, verify this. And uh, for instance, uh, they mentioned that they have uh, some for the in the sequential settings, they can use this uh, deductive verification framework, which is a tool developed at uh, Intel and uh, Otherwise, uh, for the concurrent settings um, in which we have multi-threads, so executing in parallel, um, uh, this uh, they have developed this IPF tool, which is a graphical framework and its automated version, which is called as Accordion. So the problem really here is that uh, these tools, the three tools developed by Intel, which they um, uh, mentioned in the literature that they have done for the verification of uh, Intel SCX, remain out of the reach of uh, uh, the normal public. And so that they, the, a normal user cannot have the guarantees that it was, or let's say what was verified and what kind of system model was there. So uh, this remains a limitation and a lot of uh, uh, new attacks have been uh, discovered after uh, in the last few years and that limits the 
confidence of the user in Intel SCX. So that's why we need to uh, provide some more guarantees to the system. And uh, uh, this is what we really do by uh, making use of an open source tool and uh, allowing user to get more confidence in that. Okay, so a brief comparison between uh, the proposed approach, what we did and uh, what was proposed uh, as I showed in the last slide about the three tools by Intel. So uh, the first comparison on the basis of concurrency, DVF does not support uh, concurrency. So it is sequential as I showed last uh, in the last slide. And uh, IPIF and Accordion, which were for the concurrent settings, they do not allow non-determinism. And as I already mentioned, so none of these tools, as well as the proofs that were done uh, are not available to the public. And uh, just to be fair, so our proposed solution is, uh, does not have uh, too much implementation details. The idea was that uh, to verify it, uh, uh, to begin with, to verify it at the symbolic level and then uh, uh, maybe as the implementation details or more details are available, then we can uh, uh, move it to the implementation uh, tools as well. So briefly uh, about the current attestation mechanism first, uh, that is uh, in use in Avalon currently. So there are a number of entities which are involved uh, here. So I will give a brief introduction of uh, all of these and then I will describe the uh, protocol. The first one is uh, application enclave. So this is uh, that protected region isolation environment which is created uh, by Intel SEX. Uh, and uh, the second one is the application itself. And that is, uh, 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 and then the coating enclave, uh, QE. Basically, this is the enclave, this is the Intel architecture enclave uh, which is provided in order to verify the reports and um, in order to and then if the reports are correct they after verification it can sign the code uh, sign to uh, sign that report to generate the code um, and then finally this is uh, the provisioning certification enclave pce which is uh, the local certificate authority for um, this coding enclave and so these uh, four entities basically form the user platform and uh, uh, the challenger on uh, outside the platform is basically that entity which is trying to verify that the code uh, or the uh, application is running inside the enclave. So uh, this uh, challenger or the relying party is uh, that entity. And finally in APID we have this internal attestation service IAS which represents uh, uh, the Intel uh, architecture, which is um, going to verify that the reports are correct. Uh, 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 sorry, the codes. So after conversion, they are outside the platform. We have these codes. So I will uh, describe in the flow later. So what's the difference between these? And then there is a communication between uh, all these entities, uh, uh, how they interchange uh, information with each other. And uh, that I describe in the next slide. Um, so we have all these entities, uh, again, Intel Coating Enclave, uh, the SEX application enclave, SEX application itself, and the remote challenger, or what I mentioned as uh, 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 in the previous slide as a challenger here. Okay, and then the Intel attestation service. So uh, the process starts with the remote challenger and just to remind you the intercoating enclave uh, or, or sorry, so the SEX application enclave basically in case of uh, Avalon here represents that worker which is doing that uh, operation. So the process starts here with the remote challenger which sends uh, a challenge including a nonce to the SEX application. Uh, then uh, the SEX application will give information to the application enclave about the MR enclave, which is basically uh, the uh, hash of the information. And uh, this basically is, uh, uh, this uh, QE coding enclave is what I mentioned here that will be the target for this report that will be generated by this worker. So, and the only target which is mentioned here, as I will show next uh, in the next slide, that only the target which is mentioned here 
will be able to verify that report and no other target will be able to uh, verify that report because it is based on the key which is important okay and then uh, uh, this will uh, the SEX enclave uh, uh, or the worker will then create a report which will uh, itself contain the MAC over that letter. So basically uh, inside this uh, local attestation or uh, user platform, we have um, uh, this, uh, uh, we are using this symmetry key cryptography in or, uh, and specifically using the MAC to protect the data. And then this report uh, after generation is uh, sent back to the application. So I will uh, uh, just uh, quickly switch to the next slide and then I will come back off about uh, how this uh, report is created. So the generation of report is uh, uh, here, as you have seen that uh, it needs some target information. As I mentioned that it needs the MR enclave of the coding enclave which means that uh, that particular information is uh, added here. And the key is basically derived based on that target information. So which means that only the target which has uh, uh, the, which will at that end have this information already in its enclave uh, control structure will be able to derive that key and will be able to uh, get uh, access to the uh, 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 data. Uh, or, or sorry, uh, will be able to verify that MAC. So the process uh, in short is uh, like this. So uh, the report body is uh, the major part of the report. And other than the report body, we have two other fields which are, uh, and here I show that the report body becomes a part of the report. We have the value for the key wear out protection and uh, finally, we have the MAC, which is generated by this process that is uh, that becomes a part of this report. And uh, this pack is actually create, uh, computed over this report body. And the key used for this uh, 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 computing this MAC is uh, uh, shown here. And uh, what I want to show here by this sort of ugly looking arrow is that uh, in the beginning, the value for key period protection is stored in a temporary report buffer. And then that value is actually used because there can be an attack in between. So that value is then used in the, deri uh, in the derivation of the key. And uh, other than that, we have this target information, as I mentioned uh, previously, which is coming from um, uh, the uh, application which describes who is the target for this, uh, for whom this report will be created. And then there are some other data like uh, which will be involved for this uh, key derivation. And uh, based on that, uh, this uh, derived report key will be generated and uh, by target, I mean, this is specific to that target. No other uh, enclave will be able to uh, you derive this key. Right, and then, um, I think that's all. And I come back to this slide where, uh, so this was the process which uh, I showed here, the creation of the report containing the Mac. And uh, this report will then be sent back to the SCX application, which will forward it to the Intel coding enclave. And here you can see that uh, this uh, report will be verified because it was targeted for this coding enclave with this uh, MR enclave. And uh, then it will, in this end, I will now switch again to uh, this uh, slide. So what this will do is a similar process uh, for this, uh, for this key derivation, because um, instead of this target information, now it will use its own information from the SECS register, which is the uh, SEX enclave control structure. So, uh, so basically it will use now its own and now, uh, because it was uh, at the sender end, because it was generated using the target information, and now it can use its uh, own MR enclave. So basically the same key will be generated at this end. And coming back, so it can basically compute uh, uh, or uh, calculate this key. And based on that, it will compute the MAC. Uh, with that key, it will compute the MAC over that uh, report body again. And if the two Mac matches, uh, uh, if the two Macs match, then basically the report will be verified. 
And once the report is verified, we can then uh, check the hash values inside that report. And uh, if everything is okay, so it will sign it with the APIT private key, uh, which it has uh, been provisioned by um, uh, the provisioning certification enclave here, as I showed that this is the local certificate authority for this. And then uh, this uh, will generate, so after signing, this will generate basically a quote. Uh, and then that will be sent over to uh, the SEX application and which will just forward it to the remote challenger. And now since this has been signed with its private key at this end, it can be verified uh, using its public key that uh, these uh, uh, data frame is actually correct and uh, or the report or, or the code actually is correct. And then uh, after uh, the verification of the signatures, it can also verify that the enclave status and everything is okay and the platform is not simulated one and so on. So it's, uh, uh, it, uh, the APID mechanism basically uh, depends on the internal attestation service, which adds some lag to the verification. And uh, due to this, uh, due to this limitation, basically uh, what Avalon is uh, trying to do is to basically switch to uh, or provide a secondary uh, mechanism for attestation, which is this uh, DCAP. Uh, or uh, the data center attestation primitives. So I will briefly describe about that. So all the entities you see here are uh, actually the same except this one, which is uh, the internal attestation service is actually replaced by this caching service. And uh, what this caching service represents is that uh, you have a, a local service which, which can be at different layers. And what this can do is that you can uh, verify your uh, so you have a local infrastructure and there you have cached, uh, you cache all the certificates which are required for verification and all the revocation lists and based on that you can uh, actually perform everything uh, in-house. You do not need to contact Intel each time for the verification of the codes. And this actually solves the availability issues uh, like for instance if uh, Intel attestation is not available then you are stuck and so this basically solves that availability problem as well as leads to an increase in the performance. All right, so basically uh, here we have uh, this kind of a flow uh, of the attestation process where uh, you see a couple of libraries are involved which are code provider library and uh, it also consists of uh, the code generation library and a provisioning certification enclave which is uh, the local certificate authority for this coding enclave are uh, both part of this library and these libraries are basically to uh, support kind of provide uh, you the template which you can utilize for uh, creating that infrastructure which uh, DCAP is used for. And then the process is like this that uh, applica SEX application, um, uh, yeah, so uh, SEX application basically uh, wants to get the SEX target information which is uh, like in the previous uh, end, we had this application uh, which had that information uh, to begin with, which was the MR enclave of the coding enclave. And in this case, uh, I've elaborated the process here, which is uh, uh, here that uh, the coding enclave will send its uh, PCK, meaning this uh, provisioning certification key. And uh, this is the private key of uh, PCE, Provisioning Certification Enclave. And uh, this will, uh, uh, when, uh, and the coding provider, uh, code provider library, sorry, will provide it uh, back with the TCB and the coding enclave certification data. And based on this TCB, which is uh, received, uh, it will generate its uh, uh, asymmetric key pair, which is this um, uh, attestation key and its public part so after, uh, and this uh, key pair is based on TCP. So whenever TCP changes, so basically these keys will also change. And uh, after using this, uh, after generating this key pair, uh, that will be sent, this public part will be sent over to the provisioning certification enclave along with the uh, quoting enclave ID, as well as the TCP, which is, which it obtained from uh, this code provider library. And the PCE on this end will generate uh, the 
uh, its own key pair, which is PCK and uh, this uh, its private key and its public part, and then sent over a certificate back along with its public key and uh, the coding enclave will then send its uh, target information back to the application. So it has now uh, that uh, the application now has this target information which it can send to the application enclave. And the application enclave can now create a report um, based on this target information. And then uh, this report uh, will be sent back to the application, which will send it back to the coding enclave. And here the process uh, afterwards, it is a bit similar. There are uh, uh, a few differences, which I will uh, show in the next slide. Uh, basically what happens here is that uh, it will verify the report as before, uh, because this target information is now available to it. Uh, this report was basically generated with this specific target, which is this quoting enclave. So it can verify this report. The concept here is again the same, but now the, it is based more on the uh, certificate chain rather than this epid, uh, private key. So uh, then it will, uh, uh, after the verification of the report, it is, uh, everything is fine, then it will sign the report body with the attestation key, that is its uh, private key and uh, uh, it will generate a code and send the code over to the SCX application. And uh, then, uh, so uh, this can be used to verify using the uh, certificate chain based on the root certificate and the attestation process will then complete. So uh, I now give an idea of the structure of the code, um, uh, how it is built. So the, uh, main thing here or the main kind of fields which are important here are the uh, involving the security version numbers. Coding enclave, uh, as I mentioned, is a part of uh, uh, the Intel architecture enclave and it is its security version number is important in order to see whether this is up to date or not. And its local authority that is provisioning certification enclave, we have its security version number and then the user data field can be used to communicate uh, the keys in order to establish the channel. And then we have this, uh, the actual report body, which was generated here. So meaning that uh, this uh, report and um, then uh, this code uh, signature data length, because this field, this code signature data is a variable length structure. So we need it uh, to store also its data length. And uh, this code signature data itself consists of all these fields. And uh, important here is also that we have a report for the coding enclave, which we can check that it contains the right measurements and everything. So we need also the public part of the attestation key. Um, and uh, uh, another important thing is this uh, coding enclave certification data. We want to check with what kind of uh, certification we want and the size and the certification data. Again, uh, this certification data can be variable length, so we uh, send its size along with it. So, uh, yeah, so uh, now I uh, will describe the proposed formalism which we have uh, selected in order to formally analyze it. As I mentioned in the introduction, that um, so we uh, deal with the formal, um, uh, we analyze it using formal methods in order to provide some mathematical guarantees. So I here now describe uh, what kind of formalism we have selected and the reason for that. Okay, so the workflow of the approach is like this. We have a system configuration consisting of all the entities which are involved in the attestation protocol, uh, whether it is APID or DCAP. Uh, uh, so, uh, and you have seen that for APID, there was inter attestation service, for DCAP, there was this uh, caching service and some extra code libraries were involved. The operation policies uh, basically capture the communication and the computation done by these entities. So there are two main things like uh, what kind of computation is being done by uh, each entity um, that can be, uh, uh, so the computation can be modeled as a function 
uh, formally and uh, the uh, communication is modeled by uh, using the channels. And uh, based on these three things, uh, I, uh, uh, by three, I mean this communication and the computations and here the entities, um, we can generate the symbolic model. Uh, that is, uh, so, so if you remember the uh, beginning slide of introduction, we are, we are on the left side where we had a model of the system uh, or the system itself, and then we create a formal model. So we are on that step where we are creating the symbolic model. So the symbolic model uh, we generate is, uh, uh, or the formalism that we use here is the applied by calculus. And the reason for using this is that it is, um, uh, it, is um, it has more information as compared to using a simple tree automata. And uh, otherwise uh, also it uh, provides you guarantees for um, uh, unbounded number of channels, or unbounded number of messages, and uh, it can create unbounded number of sessions between these entities. So which are the kind of guarantees that uh, we want to have. So on the right side, as uh, I showed before, so they, we have uh, the requirements in the general terms. Now we have uh, the security goals. We are trying to, uh, uh, what kind of uh, goals uh, we have from the security perspective. It can be uh, confidentiality, integrity, for instance. And we formalize that again in the form of uh, security properties or specify them as security properties. And uh, we combine these two and uh, what we do here is an automatic translation of this uh, symbolic model into uh, uh, that there is an automated tool which can do that. So I will, uh, uh, that is named as Proverif, for instance, can be utilized and which is what we utilized in order to do this translation to the horn logic. And uh, uh, basically the symbolic model is then represented by the horn clauses. And uh, the security properties are then represented as, uh, as the derivability queries on these horn clauses. And then we have a process of resolution, which means that uh, we check whether uh, now these uh, derivability queries are derivable um, on these horn clauses or not. So if in case the fact is derivable um, on these horn clauses, then we uh, try to perform this attack reconstruction at the pi calculus level, which was this um, uh, uh, model which we created. And uh, if that succeeds, uh, there are two possibilities. So if that attack reconstruction succeeds, and this box I've made basically to show that this is automatically done by uh, many tools, including Proverif, so uh, which is the one we utilized. And um, uh, if uh, this attack reconstruction succeeds, which means that this uh, reconstruction at the pi calculus level, which was this model, uh, is uh, correct. And then we have uh, successfully found a counter example to the property that is this property fails on this system, this given system for a specific reason, which we can then explore what was the reason for the failure of this property. And uh, because I mentioned that uh, uh, the kind of guarantees we are getting are for unbounded number of sessions and unbounded number of um, uh, messages between these parties. So which actually uh, you can imagine a large state space and uh, it is uh, really possible that the tool uh, cannot uh, reconstruct the attack at the pi calculus level and in that case it will result with don't know so we have to then uh, go and check in depth that what are the kind of problems which are possible here and uh, then another possibility here is that uh, i mentioned here the case when the fact was derivable and then if the fact is not derivable which the tool will return as true, which means that basically the security goal that we were trying to verify on this specific given model is actually true, uh, or, or actually this security goal is satisfied. So, um, yeah, right. So the challenges in specification of the protocol itself, uh, uh, I must say that uh, the literature uh, and even the uh, formal documentation, which is available from Intel is uh, not so well uh, described. Uh, and that is the 
kind of best words I can use for that. So, for instance, this is um, a, a Intel SCX explained document, which is, uh, in fact, the most cited documents in the literature. And uh, about the report key derivation, I described to you the structure of the report. And uh, this claim that the padding for this uh, report derivation is for the case of uh, e-report instruction, which is basically for the generation of the report, where I described to you that the um, uh, that it has a target information coming to it. So in this case, uh, they claim it is hard coded, and in the case of e-get key instruction, it is obtained from SECS. While we explored the Intel software developers manual and uh, 2019, as well as its older versions to figure out what was uh, the kind of uh, uh, reason for that. But uh, it is actually the reverse uh, as evidenced by this uh, Intel's uh, literature. So as I mentioned, the Intel literature itself uh, contains some problems. So there were uh, various ambiguous statements which uh, uh, we could not figure out what uh, they wanted to mention or uh, were really uh, the motivation for going for the formal methods to understand more about uh, uh, how the uh, process actually happens. For instance, they write that the coating enclave report is a report when the coating enclave report is certified, uh, which absolutely makes no sense to us. And not only that, um, uh, there is, in fact, a lot of inconsistent information which uh, is there in the Intel's official literature uh, talking specifically about this uh, remote attestation process. So there was really a need for a formal specification of uh, or a precise description of the protocol itself. And based on the recent attacks in the uh, uh, last uh, few years, and uh, how to come up with uh, a better or uh, a secondary uh, attestation mechanism. So what we did is uh, now describing the right part of the flow. Uh, just to go back a little bit, I am now describing this uh, security goals, how we formalize these properties, and uh, then how we can uh, adjust an overview of uh, uh, how this process, uh, uh, how we model that. Okay, so basically uh, uh, confidentiality of the data is very important in this case, as I mentioned that uh, it is the main aim of uh, Hyperledger Avalon in order to provide that and uh, the specifications um, in order to meet the specifications. And uh, the challenger basically in this case, again, represents that uh, a remote party and it has, uh, when it sends an encrypted secret um, uh, to the platform, we need to ensure that the data is not available in the clear to uh, in the clear to the attacker, and this can be represented simply as a, a reachability property. Um, uh, so, reachability property meaning that we want to explore a state in which uh, we want to check that. Uh, uh, there uh, is there any state in the system uh, where an attacker can get hold of the secret uh, this uh, secret which was sent in encrypted form uh, in its plain text form uh, uh, to the attacker is available to the attacker or not so uh, the second important property is integrity and uh, here we had to uh, um, uh, uh, so the way of uh, doing is, uh, uh, or a simple way of doing it is to have a couple of states, which or the events, uh, which is called in ProVerif. So a message unchanged event and a message accepted event. Just imagine like two entities are talking to each other. And when we have a receiver, we, we, a receiver can um, uh, check whether the message is unchanged and a state uh, where a message is uh, accepted by the receiver. So for every message that is accepted by the receiver, we need to have uh, uh, a uh, we need to have a state for which the message was unchanged. And that provides some guarantees, uh, but the problem is that there can be multiple messages which can be accepted corresponding to this message unchanged state. So, uh, and formally talking about formal languages, so this will be called as correspondence assertions that we check uh, uh, the property that for every message which is accepted by the receiver, 
there was a message unchanged even before that. And uh, here have uh, uh, duplicated that uh, same scenario. And uh, what I want to show here is uh, the solution to this is that we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, message ACC is uh, the short of this message accepted and UNC short for this unchanged to fit it here in the single line. So uh, what I do here is that a message accepted uh, for each message accepted event we can have a correspondence, uh, a corresponding um, a message unchanged event. So that now establishes a one-to-one -one correspondence between that. And now I can check that. Uh, and this uh, scenario will now no more be applicable that multiple messages may be accepted by this unchanged, uh, 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 from this uh, same message unchanged okay. event. So this is kind of uh, an overview of how uh, uh, we can uh, view from uh, overall uh, scenario, this injective uh, formally called injective correspondence assertions. And um, uh, additionally, we need to check here that uh, the reachability of message accepted event is also there. So uh, why we need to check that? The reason is that uh, if this event actually is not reachable, the query will still result the answer of true, which will be misleading because uh, there was no uh, message accepted. And then, but the event says that, uh, or but the tool says that um, uh, this, uh, uh, that uh, the everything is good sort of, right? So, so, Basically, what I mean is we are checking the property that for every message which is accepted, there is a, there is a corresponding uh, uh, message unchanged before that. And when in the case that we have no message accepted at all, it will also return an answer of true that everything is fine. But that is not what we want. We also want to have some message accepted. And then we want that for each message accepted, there is a corresponding message unchanged event, right? So that is why this uh, we need to, in addition to these injective correspondence assertions, uh, we also need to check the reachability of a message accepted. So this is the kind of overall uh, 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 at a uh, high level an idea of how uh, we verify the properties for um, uh, uh, using this uh, ProVerif tool. And uh, now I summarize the work. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, we know that, so Avalon is a tool for improving the scalability and the confidentiality. And uh, we have seen the specification uh, or the flow of the inter SEX APID and DCAP, the two attestation uh, mechanisms which are provided by Intel SEX. And I also want to mention that um, Intel SEX has been selected, but it is, uh, uh, of course, not the only possibility. The development currently has been, uh, um, uh, can be implemented on other uh, trusted execution environments such as uh, AMD secure processor. And during this process of specification, we have uh, discovered various discrepancies, uh, even in the uh, official literature, as I mentioned, a few of them. And uh, we analyze the confidentiality and the integrity on the symbolic model. And uh, yeah, so these were the kind of uh, two most important properties uh, which are important in the scenario. For instance, the confidentiality that our data remains protected and the integrity that our data is unchanged. And the future work that we have in this particular direction is um, like Intel recently uh, released uh, or, or not released, actually announced uh, its trust domain extensions. And uh, there they give uh, more uh, power to the trust domains, which are in comparison to the legacy virtual man, uh, machines. And uh, they have uh, actually released uh, also the specification documents. Uh, and uh, we are going through that and we have, uh, we can uh, foresee that actually in the future, Intel is going to uh, utilize uh, that for uh, a combined attestation mechanism between uh, the trusted domains and uh, uh, the SGX uh, framework. So 
uh, probably that is going to be uh, in use um, uh, for both of them. And, uh, but there is uh, currently, uh, it is not in the timeline for Avalon to move to that. And uh, otherwise, uh, one of the things uh, we did not consider in this work was uh, about side channels that uh, we do not uh, deal with these. And we assume that uh, the cryptography is perfect. And uh, the reason being that the Indian SEX model itself uh, does not cover the side channels. So it is the responsibility of uh, the Enclave uh, developer, for instance, to ensure that uh, there are no vulnerabilities inside uh, the Enclave and side channels cannot be exploited. Uh, but of course, they can be considered and uh, there are various uh, mechanisms which can be utilized for that. Um, there are different tools available for that also. And uh, there are information theoretic concepts which can be utilized here in order to provide uh, some abstract guarantees at least. And finally, as I mentioned, so the implementation is not limited to Intel SEX as a secondary thing, we can uh, provide some uh, guarantees uh, using uh, or, or some implementation using some other um, trusted execution environments, including uh, the AMD secure processor. And AMD has uh, also uh, recently released its uh, SEV SMP version, which is uh, providing also uh, many guarantees, including the remote attestation. And there it would be nice to explore how uh, uh, or what kind of guarantees or additional uh, uh, things we can get from that uh, AMD secure processor before going into the detailed uh, development phase. It is, uh, 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 we can have uh, uh, idea from the formal model that how it can be useful. And here I list a few of uh, the key references which are, uh, 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 which are used in this presentation. So I mentioned about Intel SCX explain document, and these are the two tools which Intel, where Intel mentioned their tool, uh, tools, and uh, there are some software developer manuals available. And, um, and these are two papers, so we can, uh, so, so these are available and you can go through them. Uh, all documentation is uh, available. And uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And um, um, if you can contribute to Hyperledger Avalon, I have the link here, the slides will be available. And uh, of course you can Google that Hyperledger Avalon. And uh, we have here also a link for the project updates, what kind of formal, uh, the kind of formal guarantees that we are providing and uh, uh, to uh, deal with the attestation mechanism formally and then to provide a better attestation mechanism in the end uh, in order to uh, utilize. And uh, of course, I will try to answer the questions that I can now. And otherwise, if you have any question in the future, you can uh, contact me uh, by email. So that's all from my side. And um, I'll see if you have some questions. Uh... So uh, I think there are... Uh two uh, questions like uh, why we are using symbolic model instead of computational mode. Okay, right. So that's an interesting question. So um, yeah, so basically, uh, the reason for using that was that um, it's always good to start uh, at a uh, uh, basic step. So symbolic model and the or if I go back to the slide, just a moment. So Okay, so this one, yeah, the symbolic model that we generate uh, can be utilized for the computational model actually, and uh, but it is not the reverse. So for computational model, the first thing is, or the first problem is that you need a lot of details, which Intel unfortunately hasn't made public. So the symbolic model and was very basic and was a kind of starting step where we could uh, go ahead with that. And of course we can, uh, when we have these details and uh, we can go to the computational model in order to get uh, some further guarantees for that. Yeah, thank you. So I think there's no question. Yeah. Thank you, Mama Usama. It was very okay. insightful talk.
Yeah, welcome. And so that brings us to end of the part one of our four weeks, uh, three three part session. And then next week we have interesting topics lined up as part of our event. And then on in next week, you will get to hear about the production grid deployments and the tools around which using which you can deploy a production grid hyperledger fabric network. And then how do you measure the performance once you deploy the network? How do you visualize what's happening in a blockchain network using Explorer tool? And then we will also have a blockchain automation framework. It is an automated um, deployment tool, which was contributed by Accenture and now it's in labs. And they will be speaking about the things which are considered as part of VAF and how easy it is for us to deploy a production grid fabric network. So interesting topics lined up for next week. We will share out, I have put, put a registration link for November 7th event. And then please feel uh, free to ask us any questions. Do look out for our LinkedIn notifications, posters, and today's event will be posted on our YouTube channel. Yeah, thank you all. I think we can wrap up now.